Dear colleagues, we are ready to start our afternoon session today. And uh, the first speaker uh, speakers will be Clemens uh, of Stadler, Clemens Raab, and Georg uh, Ravensburger uh, with the talk Computing Elements of Certain Form in Ideals to Prove Properties of Operators. Please welcome. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, let me briefly share my slides. Mm -hmm. I hope you can see them now. Can you? Uh, yes, yes, we can see everything's all right. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, then again, thank you for the introduction and good afternoon. So in this talk, I want to share with you <coughs> several techniques which allow us to compute elements of certain form in non-commutative polynomial ideals. And additionally, I want to show you how we can use these techniques to prove statements about linear operators. And all of this is joint work with my colleagues, Clemens Raab and Georg Regensburger. And to start things off, I would like to share with you our motivation on why we are interested in computing such elements. 
And to this end, let us maybe look at the following theorem by Arias and Gonzalez, which deals with the solvability of an operator equation. In particular, it says that this equation here has a solution X, if and only if certain range inclusions hold. That is, if the ranges of certain operators are contained in the ranges of other operators. Where, by the way, this star here denotes the Hermitian adjoint, and this dagger here denotes the Moore Penrose inverse of the operator A. And now, what we want to do is we want to prove such kind of statements fully automatically using the computer. And the question is well, how do we do this? And usually, when one has a statement about operators, and when one wants to show that certain assumptions imply a certain claim, then this is typically done by a formal computation where one works directly with the operators. In our approach, however, we first translate our statement about operators into non-commutative polynomials. Then we solve a problem involving these polynomials to obtain a statement about them. And finally, by applying a recently developed framework, this statement about polynomials immediately yields a rigorous proof of the statement about operators. And the main advantage of this approach is that this part here, where actually most of the work has to be done, can be automatized and done by the computer. In particular, in this part here, we can make use of the rich theory of non-commutative Krebner bases, which allows us to solve uh, quite a lot of non-trivial tasks. But before we look uh, into these three steps in a bit more detail, let us maybe first recall what we mean by non-commutative polynomials. So we start with a finite set X of indeterminates and then form the free monoid over X. And then using the free monoid and the coefficient field K, we form the free algebra in X over K. That is the set of all finite formal linear combinations of coefficients from our coefficient field K and of words or monomials from the free monoid. And then there is also an addition and a multiplication which turns this set into a ring. And the elements in this ring look and behave very similarly to usual commutative polynomials, with the big difference that the indeterminates in this ring do not commute with each other. So more precisely, our indeterminates still commute with coefficients, but not with each other. So the multiplication in this ring is non-commutative. And we have to distinguish between a multiplication from the left and a multiplication from the right. And this is why we typically refer to the elements in this ring as non-commutative polynomials. And this is also why we have the notion of two-sided ideals. So for a set capital F of non-commutative polynomials, we denote by F in parentheses the two-sided ideal generated by F, which is the set of all two-sided linear combinations from elements from F. And if we only allow one-sided linear combination, well, let's say we are only allowed to multiply our generators from the right, then we obtain the right ideal generated by F, which we denote by this subscript row here. Okay, so now with this notation and this knowledge, we can come back to our three steps for proving operator statements. And we have the following approach, which is due to uh, Clemens Raab, Georg Regensburger, and Jamal Hussein Poor. And the starting point is a statement about linear operators, which we want to prove. So similar to the one that we saw before. And the first step that we have to do to do this is the translation. Here we first have to phrase all our assumptions on the operators, as well as the claimed property, first in terms of identities, and then we have to convert these identities into non-commutative polynomials in some free algebra. Then we come to the second step, the solving step. And here we have to find special elements of a certain form in the two-sided ideal generated by our assumptions. And in the simplest case, we know the element that we want to find explicitly. In this case, finding the element in the ideal comes down to simply verifying the ideal membership of this polynomial. However, in many other cases, we do not know the element that we want to find explicitly. Now, this can be the case, for example, when the operator statement contains certain existential claims. And we will see such a situation in just a minute. But if we can find the right elements, 
then we are essentially done. Because then a recently developed framework guarantees the existence of a formal proof in terms of operators of the statements that we started with. So the central part is really the second solving step here where we have to find the right elements. And to see how this looks like, let's maybe apply these three steps to our theorem from the beginning. So here's again the theorem and let's try to prove the implication from right to left. Following the three steps from before, we first have to phrase all the properties in terms of identities. And to phrase these assumptions here in terms of identities, we can make use of the following characterization. Uh, this is known as Douglas Lemma, and this states that a range inclusion of operators can be characterized by the existence of a certain factorization. So using this characterization, we obtain the following six assumptions, where the first four identities are the, are the defining identities of the Moore-Penrose inverse of A, so they ensure the existence of this operator. And then the, these two identities correspond to the two range inclusions. And additionally, for every identity, we also obtain the respective adjoint statement. This gives us a total of 12 assumptions. And this here is the claimed property. And translating them into polynomials gives us these polynomials. And we can see now that the claim translates into finding a polynomial of this form in the two-sided ideal generated by our 12 assumptions, where A, B, and C are known, but where the, this X part here is unknown. And this now finally brings me to the main topic of my talk, namely to techniques that allow us to compute precisely such elements. And the first technique that I want to share with you is a very classic one, namely ideal intersections. And ideal intersections are useful for finding polynomials in an ideal I, which are, for example, of this form, where we know a certain factor A in the middle, or do not know any the, the, the prefix or the, the, the postfix. And such elements can be computed, for example, by intersecting the ideal I with the two-sided ideal generated by A. Or similarly, we can also search for elements of this form where we now know a certain prefix. In this case, we would intersect I with the right ideal generated by A. And then, of course, we can also add known terms. Uh, in this case, we would intersect I with the right ideal generated by A and C. And this is also precisely the form that we are looking for in our operator statement that we want to prove. So this brings us to the following idea. We compute the intersection of the two-sided ideal generated by our assumptions with the right ideal generated by A and C, and then compute generators of these intersections. And among these generators, look for polynomials which are of, these, of this form with the additional property that this free part R ends with the variable B, because this is then precisely such an element that we are looking for. And at this point, I should probably note two things. First of all, um, ideal membership of non-commutative polynomials in two-sided ideals is undecidable in general. And this is also reflected in the fact that there are finitely generated two-sided ideals which do not admit a finite Grebner basis. And since all the procedures that we talk about today rely on Grebner basis computations, all these procedures are in fact not terminating algorithms, but only enumeration procedures. And what we do in practice is that we just start such a possibly infinite computation, and then using some termination criterion abort the computation after a certain amount of time, and then work with what is called a partial Grebner basis or a partial generating set. And often these partial Grebner basis suffice to do what we want to do. And the second thing that I should mention is that, of course, ideal intersections are not the only way how we can compute such uh, elements. Yeah, this case here, for example, can also be seen as a factorization problem, where we try to find a factorization of this element C in the quotient algebra Kx modulo i. And then, for example, Bell, Heinle, and Lewandowski showed in a, in a recent paper how we can compute all such factorizations of C if a finite dimensional filtration of the quotient algebra is available. 
However, the problem is that we typically do not have such a finite dimension of regression. But coming back to our approach, uh, we are now faced with the following problem. So we have two two-sided ideals called I and J and two right ideals, I rho and J rho. And we want to compute all these four different kinds of intersections. And first of all, the two cases on the diagonal are very classical results due to not back from uh, 1998. And he found that we can do essentially the same thing that we also do for intersecting two commutative ideals. So we introduce a new variable t and then compute a certain elimination ideal. And as in the commutative case, computing this elimination ideal can be done by Grobner basis techniques. However, these two cases are not precisely what we want because to search for these elements, we would like to intersect a two-sided ideal with the right ideal. So in our case, we are now interested in these two cases, which are of course symmetric. So let's only look at the one on the lower left. And the idea how to compute this intersection is to consider I as a right ideal and then to intersect two right ideals. So we already know how to intersect right ideals. That's good. And it remains to discuss how we can consider a two-sided ideal as a right ideal. And here we can use a result by Green, which describes how to turn a two-sided Grebner basis of an ideal into a one-sided Grebner basis. And so this brings us to the following procedure. First, we compute a two-sided Grebner basis G of the ideal I. Then we use the result of Green to turn this two-sided Grebner basis into a one-sided Grebner basis G rho. So this is now a generating set of I, but as a right ideal. And then finally, we can intersect two right ideals using the technique above. However, we always have this problem of undecidability of ideal membership. And in this computation, we notice this in two ways. First of all, the two-sided Grebner basis G need not be finite. And even if this uh, Grebner basis G is finite, then this one-sided Grebner basis G rho is still typically infinite. And in fact, we've shown that this set G rho turns out to be finite if and only if the ideal I is zero dimensional, which in practice is almost never the case. So in practice, we can usually only work with a finite subset of this set G rho, and hence only work with a subset of the real intersection. However, in our application of uh, proving operator statements, we can make use of the following observation. Namely, we can, without losing any relevant information, restrict the set G rho to only those polynomials which make sense in terms of operators. And this restriction often causes this set G rho to become finite, or at least allows us to work with kind of a better approximation of the intersection that we're interested in. And using this technique, we can now also finish the, the statement that we want to prove. So coming back to our statement and to the translation into polynomials, we can now intersect a two-sided ideal generated by our assumptions with the right ideal generated by A and C. And then we can see that we find this polynomial here. And this shows that the operator represented by C star is the desired solution to our equation. And additionally, we can not only find this element, but we can also provide a representation of this element in terms of our assumptions. And this representation here can be considered as a certificate of the proof, which can be checked independent of how it was obtained and in a very easy way. And so I hope that this shows you that ideal intersections can provide a useful tool to search for elements of, of special forms. However, not all elements that are of interest can be found by ideal intersections. And one class of elements which cannot be found are called positive factorizations. So an operator P is called positive if there exists another operator Q such that P factorizes as Q star Q. In terms of polynomial, this, this translates into finding a polynomial of this form in the ideal I generated by our assumptions, where the P part is known 
but since we have no idea how this Q looks like, um, we cannot use ideal intersections. And as before, if, for example, a finite dimensional filtration is available, then we can use explicit factorization algorithms. But one approach that we have successfully used is to search for such elements by computing homogeneous polynomials in the ideal I. So this brings us to the following task. Uh, given an ideal I and a degree matrix D, where the I row of D defines the degree of the variable XI, we want to compute the homogeneous part of I with respect to D. That is, we want to compute a generating set of the ideal generated by all homogeneous elements in the ideal I. And then we can um, choose this degree matrix D in such a way that such uh, positive factorizations become homogeneous if this part Q is reasonably nice. And while this homogeneous part can be computed for all degree matrices with rational coefficients, I will now only discuss the case where this D is the identity matrix because this makes for a simpler presentation. So the goal is to compute the homogeneous part of an ideal I with respect to the identity matrix. And to compute this, we have generalized a method of Miller, which allows to compute all monomials in a commutative ideal. And so what do we have to do in our generalization? Well, first we have to form this quotient algebra A over the free algebra uh, in the variables X and in new variables T and T to the minus one. In particular, for every variable XI, we introduce new tracing variables TI and TI to the minus one. And in this quotient, we require the variables TI to be cancelable from the right. And we, we, we require the, the TIs to commute with all XJs and with each other. And then we can consider this map phi, which appends to every monomial in X, a copy of this monomial in the variables T. And then we form this ideal T dot I, which is the ideal generated by those polynomials that we obtain by applying this map phi to the generators of our original ideal. And then the homogeneous part of I is given by this elimination ideal, where we eliminate the, the tracing variables. And as before, this elimination ideal can be computed by Grotner basis techniques. And to see that this uh, is really a useful technique, let's maybe also consider an example here. And let's look at this lemma again by Arias and Gonzalez, which now deals with the existence of positive solutions to this operator equation. So it says that if this equation has a positive solution X, then also this operator here is positive. And so in order to prove this lemma, we have to show that there exists an operator R such that this thing here factorizes as R star R. Or in terms of polynomial, this means we have to find such an element in the ideal I generated by our assumptions. And I now I want to show you how we can find this element by computing the homogeneous part of I. And in particular, I want to show you how we can do this using our Mathematica package called operator GP. So this package implements all the procedures and all the algorithms that I described today. And additionally also provides several auxiliary functions for proving operator statements. Okay, so to prove this lemma using the package, we first have to define all our assumptions in terms of non-commutative polynomials. We have to provide a monomial ordering with respect to which all our computations will be done. And we have to set up the right degree matrix D. And then before we actually compute the homogeneous part, we first compute a Grubner basis of our ideal. This step is not necessary for the correctness of the procedure, but it usually speeds up the computation. So after computing this Grubner basis, we compute the homogeneous part of, of our ideal. And ultimately we can see that a generating set of this homogeneous part uh, contains this element, which provides precisely such a positive factorization that we are looking for. And consequently, this proves the lemma. 
And one thing that, that I should note here is that our computations are very expensive. Uh, this can also be seen here by looking at the number of ambiguities that are considered. So in total, we have around 40,000 ambiguities, which corresponds to about 40,000 S polynomials that are computed in the underlying Grabner basis computation. And considering that the input was rather small, um, this is actually quite a lot. And this is a general problem that we have that most of our techniques tends to explode very quickly. But yeah, and the last few minutes of my talk, I want to spend on showing you how a minor adaption of this approach to compute the homogeneous part also allows us to compute another class of interesting elements, namely monomials. So in this case, we start with a right ideal, I row, and our goal is to compute the monomial part of I row. That is, we want to compute a generating set of the right ideal that is generated by all monomials that are in I row. And we can do essentially the same thing as before. The only thing that changes is that here in this quotient, we no longer require the TIs to be to commute with, with themselves. And also note that this ideal T dot I row is now a right ideal as well. But everything else remains exactly the same. And then the monomial part is again given by this elimination ideal. Unfortunately, however, this approach does not immediately extend to two-sided ideals. And it's not too hard to see that uh, this principal ideal I uh, generated by X1 minus X2 provides a kind of a counterexample because then a simple computation shows that the polynomial X1, X2 minus X2, X1 is contained in this intersection but clearly this polynomial is not contained in the monomial part of I. So to compute the monomial part of two-sided ideals, uh, we really have to come up with something new and this, it is not clear yet how this new approach will look like. Okay, but so to summarize my talk, uh, we have presented several techniques which allow us to compute elements of certain forms in non-commutative polynomial ideals. And in particular, we have seen how to do this using ideal intersections. And we have seen this how, uh, we've seen how to do this by computing the homogeneous part of a two-sided ideal, respectively by computing the monomial part of a one-sided ideal. And of course, there are also several other techniques which I just did not have the time to mention here. And all the techniques that I've presented today are implemented in the software package operator GP and have already successfully been used to automatically prove statements about linear operators. In particular, so far, we have worked in the field of generalized inverses, so statements similar to the ones that we have seen during the talk, and also in the field of homological algebra. And um, yeah, what's up for the future? Um, on the one hand, we want to investigate possibilities for optimizing our computations, because as I've briefly mentioned, our computations are very expensive, uh, which restricts their use in practice. So we want to try and, 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 and optimize our computations if possible. And on the other hand, there are also several classes of elements which are of interest but for which we do not yet have dedicated tools to search for them. So we also want to find ideal theoretic operations that allow us to also search for these kind of elements. But for now, this is everything that I wanted to tell you. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Clemens. And are there any questions? Okay, uh, let's thank uh, the t speaker again. Uh, okay, and we proceed with our next speaker. Uh, the next talk uh, is by Amir Hussain uh, Sadegimanesh and Matthew England. 
improving algebraic yeah. tools to study bifurcation sequences of population models. Please. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. So as you can uh, see, the title is uh, Improving Algebraic Tools to Study Bifurcation Sequences of Population Models. This is a joint work with uh, Matthew England as a part of a bigger project called GeoCAD at the University, Coventry University. So the first thing that uh, I should tell you is, um, I should tell you the kind of questions that we are going to study uh, in population dynamics, but these questions, um, the similar questions can arise in chemical reaction network or epidemiology or ecology and other uh, contexts. Uh, then we convert these questions to a question about uh, parametric polynomial system of equations, then we can use tools from algebraic geometry. I will tell you some of former existing algorithms that can answer these questions. And finally, uh, the new algorithm, which is uh, the result of this uh, work this year. And uh, I close with some remarks. So in a population dynamic, you have a uh, species and this species, uh, by a species I mean, it can be animal in an ecological example, it can be a bacteria in a lab experiment, it can be a human like number of infected or recovered or immune uh, people in epidemiological example. So you have a species and this species has a quantity, a number, a population, which changes over the time so you have a variable, which I show with a capital N. Uh, and when a variable change, you have derivative. So you have derivative with respect to time, and you can write a set of equations like this one, set of differential equations, and you have a dynamical system. Uh, the simplest uh, example in population models is logistic, logistic growth that you might have heard in uh, calculus courses. So what happens, you have a species, a population, um, and these species live in an environment. It can be a jungle, it can be an experimental uh, plate uh, or whatever. The thing is that uh, these species uh, grow and reproduce, so the population increase, but the environment have a limited size or volume, so it, it cannot grow up to infinity. Or it might be not the problem of the size of the environment, but the problem of the amount of resource or food for these species to survive. So it's a limited amount of resource. It can support limited number of uh, species. So at the beginning, you have a fast speed of growth because there's abundance of resource. But when the population size become large, then the amount of resource per individual become little, and then uh, you have lower speed of growth until you reach the maximum capacity, which we call it carrying capacity. So everything is clear. You have two steady state. By steady state, we mean a situation that the population doesn't change. It's uh, like stable. So if you start with zero, you, you will continue with zero. That's one steady state. If you start with non-zero population, it grow until reach the carrying capacity. If you start above carrying capacity, it goes down to, to carrying capacity. So it's very clear. A more interesting model is a uh, strong alley effect, a population that has this behavior. So the difference is you still have the competition for the resources, but there is also another thing which is added now, cooperativity between species. Let's consider uh, an example, let's see. Let's say that there is a specific fish that releases some chemical from his body to the water, which make it safer for him against some disease. Mm -hmm. Now, the situation is that if in your water tank, you have very few number of these fish, the amount of this chemical is very little in the water. So it's not very safe for him and the fishes start to dying out. But if the number of fishes is more, then the amount of this uh, chemical in the water is also enough or more. And then this fish is safe to survive in that water. They start growing. So the situation is that you have uh, more steady state. If you have like um, less than alley threshold 
uh, you start with the population less than early very short. The environment is not very hospitable for them. They start dying out, going, going to extinction. If you start above early threshold, then the environment is good and they, there is enough cooperativity. They survive and they grow up to reaching the canning capacity. So you have three steady states, canning capacity, extinction, and early threshold, which the unstable steady state. And there is like some equation here. And you can normalize the model uh, so that the canning capacity become one, and then you have only one problem, just to make things simpler. And I show it with a small uh, b, that is early threshold parameter. So when you have one species, one population, things are clear, you see everything. It become more interesting when you have several populations. So here I'm showing uh, like three population in three patches. By patch, I mean, if you are considering like a ecological example, you uh, divide the jungle to different uh, parts which are separate, or you can consider the experimental lab with several wells that you put the bacteria to grow there. Or you can consider, like, say, the COVID situation in epidemiological uh, context. You have different countries and you consider population of different countries. So you have several patch. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put same species in them. So you can consider, like, they have same. And we assume that they, all of them have uh, early uh, effect behavior. So. They have a early threshold parameter B, and I consider it's the same for all of them. Now, I connect these patches to each other, and I consider the uh, complete uh, directed graph for simplicity. So if from every patch, you can go to another patch. And I also make it simpler by considering that the, the weight or dispersal rate or the strength of connectivity or the traffic between every two patch has the same uh, uh, rate, I denote it by another letter, A. So I have two parameters, early threshold and uh, dispersal rate. Now the new question is, how many steady states this system has? Mm -hmm. When you say a steady state, it means uh, things become a stable, no change. No? And when you say there is no change anymore, it means derivative becoming zero. So to study the steady states, you need to study the solution set of a system of equations, which in this case are polynomial. Uh, and if you have, so in the previous picture, I showed like three patch the graph, but you can consider arbitrary n number. So in that case, you have n variables, population at patch i is the ith variable, and you have two parameters, dispersal rate and the uh, um, alley threshold. So this uh, network was uh, studied before in a group of Gergely Roche at the University of Szeged. They showed that if you have a small dispersal rate, the value of A is very small, this system behaves similar to N disjoint uh, uh, system with Ali threshold, uh, Ali effect. So each of them has three steady states. Together, they have three to power n steady states. And they also showed if this uh, dispersal rate is large enough, then all these n patches together behave like one well-mixed uh, uh, patch. So they will have three steady states. That was shown before. And then the questions that are left are, what about the intermediate values of uh, dispersal rate, how many steady states we have for those values. And the other question is that, okay, we start with three to power n steady states when A is small, and when we increase A at the end, we end up with three. But is it decreasing monotonically or, or not? That's also a question. Hmm? So before I come to Coventry uh, University uh, in group of Gerger Roche, we studied these questions, and I will tell you two type of approaches that was used in previous year, and then I will go to the new approach after it. So the first approach to uh, to answer this question, these kinds of questions, let's explain it on a very simple example. 
So consider this uh, system of equations, which only with only one equation, a degree two polynomial, x squared plus bx plus c equal to zero. We have one variable x and two parameter b and c. The question is how many solution, real solution this system has? Well, it's not a fixed num uh, one number because it's a parametric system for different choices of the parameters B and C, you have different number of solutions. The first thing we do is uh, we use elimination theory with Grobner basis to get rid of the variables. And you end up with some polynomials involving only parameters. Here you only have one, uh, one polynomial, B squared minus 4C, which uh, the union of solution set of these polynomials is called discriminant variety. Here I have one and the solution set is plotted on the right. You see this curve, the red color. This uh, discriminant variety has one very important property, which is this. The number of solutions to the system is invariant on each connected component of the complement of this curve. So the parameter region here is a two-dimensional R2, B, C. And then this is the discriminant variety. And the complement of this curve has two connected components, the left side and the right side, you can see. It. And uh, so if I know the number of solutions for one point at the left, I know the number of solutions for every choices on the left. Huh? So here I can draw this curve. It's lower dimension and the curve is simple. But in general, we might have like mm, bigger dimension for the parameter space, or these polynomials can be complicated and you cannot plot them. How to algorithmically deal to study these connected components? There is a tool called Slendic algebraic decomposition. I'm not going to say what it exactly, I will just give you some rough feeling what it does. And I also I only consider the open CAD because in biology, uh, looking at the open cell, open regions is enough. We don't care about zero measure uh, sets. So what this uh, method OpenCAD does, uh, it receives the polynomial, the discriminant uh, polynomials here in our case, and it gives you a partition of the space to uh, find that number of open sets. These open sets are semi-algebraic it gives you exact description of these uh, semi-algebraic sets. And the important uh, property is that each cell is entirely inside one connected component of the complement of the solution sets of those polynomials. So here in this case, it decomposed to four open cells, one, two, three, four. And uh, the good thing is it's final number of cells. And the other good thing, because of the discriminant variety is that number of solutions is in vain in each of them. So what is left is to pick up one simple point from each of these four regions and then substitute it back into the original system, solve it, count the number of solutions. Then I know uh, the number of solutions everywhere in the parameter region. And in this case, it says that in cells one, two, and four, you get two real solutions. In cell three, you get zero solutions and it solves everything. So that's a very good thing. It is already implemented in a method package called root finding parametric. So we first started by saying that let's try using this uh, package for, for, the, well, uh, for the population dynamic model that I showed you, the three patch, uh, the n patch population. So this is in uh, reference three, you will see the references at the last slide. It, is a joint, uh, it was a joint work with Gege Roche previous year. So with Maple Star, I mean root finding package of Maple on my personal computer. And with CAD Star, I mean open CAD with respect to the discriminant variety. So we tried the CAD for two patches, so the number of patches being two. We got the, the composition of the parameter space, the number of SCD states, and everything is done. But unfortunately, for three patch, Maple on a normal computer was not able to finish the computation. Did we give up? No. So here we were letting A and B, both parameters, to be free. 
but if we fix value of one of the parameters, let's say I put B to be equal to 0 0.2 and only let one parameter A to be uh, free. So this is the horizontal axis in the lower uh, plot is A and the vertical axis is the number of synthesis. It's not B anymore. B is fixed here. The method on my laptop was able to finish the computation for n equal to three. So we thought of a new algorithm. So this is also a work that is done uh, previous year. So it's, I, I still not in the, in the new work for Coventry. So in this work, which is in the reference number two, you can read that, there are two steps. The preliminary step is uh, you pick up a uh, final number of uh, values for one of the parameters, let's say equally distance choices 10 or 11 for B, you fix each time and you get the one dimensional CAD, which gives you the intersection of the two dimensional CAD with these horizontal uh, red lines. And you get a kind of like feeling how it should look like the two dimensional one, but it's still not, it's not enough. The second step, which is more important is we adopt a numeric search, which I'm not going to describe here, that uh, find where the, these uh, like boundary of the regions between the regions that you have different number of cis has different behavior, the behavior change. Like what? Like in this example, it find two places, like there is a crossing and there is interesting curve and the final output is here. So in the left side, you see the two-dimensional CD, it tells you you start with three to power three steady states and you end up with three. And the intermediate values are 21, 15, and nine. It also find for you that in this tiny region here, which is zoomed in the right side, you have interesting thing happen. What is happening is that for this value of B, you start with 27, 21, then you enter 15, nine, then increase to 15 and then decrease to nine. So the answer to the second question that we had, if you remember from previous slides before, is that it is not always monotonically decreasing. It can temporarily increase as you can see here. It was nice, but uh, this algorithm uh, uses numeric search. So it can guarantee that the behavior is as described up to some accuracy. So here for this uh, plot is like up to seven digit uh, accuracy after decimal point. Mm -hmm. What happens for a very, very tinier regions, it doesn't tell you about that. So now we go to the new work that is done this year. So we looked at back to approach one. Approach one was deterministic without numeric uh, stuff. So why it was not possible to uh, f finish it, the computation on, on the la uh, laptop for me too. If you remember approach one had two steps. The first step was finding the discriminant variety with your devices, and then the open CAD with respect to that. So we checked manually doing the uh, step one, and we found that the step one was not feasible. It, it didn't finish, it, the it, uh, memory get full, and then the, the operation is stopped without getting the final result. So we thought, well, let's, get rid of Grobner basis in this computation. So how to do that? Uh, you can use the projection step of the synthetic algorithm decomposition algorithm to get rid of the variables and ending up with some polynomials involving only the parameters. With this property that the union of solution set of these new polynomials contains the discriminant variety. That's enough for, for our goal. So that's the first thing that we did. And we even made it better. So uh, for the operation, the projection operation of CAD is doubly exponential. But if you have equational constraint to use, you can remove uh, one unit from the double exponent of this complexity for each equational constraint. And we have in this context, we have uh, uh, more than the number of uh, variables, uh, equational constraints, and the double exponentiality of this uh, projection set is uh, number of variables. 
and we are removing for each of the equational constants. So we can remove this doubly exponentiality and uh, we end up with single exponential uh, computation. And that's enough. Then the second step of the approach is the same, open CAD with respect to solution set of this new polynomial. Okay. So uh, we implemented uh, this algorithm in Maple and uh, applied on this example. At the re uh, left side, you see the what we got with the second approach before, uh, which I showed you before. And in the right side, you see the union of solution set of the polynomials that we get with this new um, algorithm. And you see that the boundary of the regions is contained in these uh, curves. And if you look at that zoom region, there was interesting behavior happening. You see that there are two extra curves, but it's fine. And then when you apply the open CAD, uh, for, for example, for in this, uh, this uh, zoomed area, you get 21 open cells, and then you pick up one sample point for each of them and solve and count the number of solutions, you get the same thing as the left side. So uh, it shows that uh, what we found with numeric search in previous year was exactly everything. And uh, so the conclusion is that we develop a new algorithm, which is uh, doing what root finding parametric was doing before for us, but it can handle larger examples and it has two good properties. It's uh, free of group basis, and also it's free of numeric approximation. Now, one question that may um, appear in mind of some of you is that, uh, is the numeric uh, uh, algorithm of previous year now is useless that we have this deterministic one, which can do the same thing without the numeric approximations? The answer is no. So the root finding parametric was going for up to two patch and was not able to handle three patch. I didn't check the limitation of this new algorithm yet up to how many patches we can go, but for sure it will stop somewhere. Then you can equip this uh, numeric thing of previous year on this one instead of equipping it on the, uh, on the root finding parametric and go for larger examples. So the, the previous year algorithm is still useful uh, depending on what example you are. So that's uh, the end, and these are the references. The first work is the, uh, the new work at Coventry University, and the two others are the previous work with Gege Rush previous year. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, any questions? Actually, uh, I do have a question. Uh, if you go back to the very first slides of your presentation, you considered two models, uh, two population models, uh, and both of them uh, stabilize when uh, time goes to infinity, right? So th mm -hmm. the, the first one stabilizes at one point and uh, the second have, has two cases uh, of stabilization. What if we switch to uh, cyclic models like uh, uh, predator-prey model uh, or gi given by lotka Volterra equations where we have cycles, uh, the, the I mean, oscillations, uh, Yes, behaviors. yes, yes, something like this. Uh, well, how does it um, complicate uh, the yeah. solution or mm -hmm. yeah so the thing is that here we are studying the models that you are interested in steady states because they can be converted to the question about number of solutions of a equation or system but when you have oscillations then it's not like the solution set of a polynomial equations no? so then you cannot use these uh, tools anymore so you cannot talk about you know, like categorizing the oscillations when you have the oscillations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we can study here is like for which values of uh, parameters, the dispersal rate, the uh, Alice threshold, you have like nine steady states, five steady states. So it's only uh, study the steady states. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't okay. study the models with oscillation or chaotic behavior. Mm -hmm. 
Right, thank you. And no more questions? All right, let's thank the speaker again. All right, uh, uh, we proceed with our program, and uh, now we will have two consecutive talks of the same authors, and the first talk uh, is given by Amit Rakui and Thomas Turm, uh, testing dynamicity of chemical reaction networks uh, using comprehensive Grobner systems. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, do, do you hear me? Um, yes, uh, yes everything me? is all right. Mm -hmm. So, let me share my screen. Okay. So, okay, my name is Amit Rakwi. I'm going to present this talk. Um, which is a joint talk with uh, Thomas Sturm. Um, uh, it is on testing binomiality of chemical reaction networks using comprehensive Grobner systems. So um, let's start with what is or how computer algebra is used in uh, chemical reaction networks or in general in biosciences. So this is basically a, uh, an important field and I would say an emerging field. Uh, recently, computer algebra has been used very extensively in chemical reaction networks or biological uh, networks. And the central tool uh, for this is basically um, autonomous ODEs. So um, to each chemical reaction network or biological network, an autonomous ODE set can be associated. So how is this done? I just um, very briefly uh, mentioned this uh, using uh, this well-known Michaelis-Menten reaction network that you can see here, which is uh, basically the reaction of an enzyme and a substrate which produces this ES and uh, it is reversible. Uh, so uh, ES also produces the enzyme and substrate. And then there's a second reaction there that you can see. So um, the species of this reaction are ES, ES and P. And um, they have concentrations which can be changed within time as the reactions happen. So we associate a variable to each to the concentration of each uh, uh, each species. So in this particular case, for example, S is associated to uh, the uh, species S, and um, so on. So S dot here means the change of the concentration of the species S within time. And uh, one can uh, write the OD of S dot equal to some polynomial uh, in a very concrete way. Uh, I'm not going to mention how this is written, but I guess just can tell you that um, there's a concrete and systematic way of writing the polynomial FS such that S dot equal to FS is the ODE that describes the change of the concentration of the, um, of the substrate S in, in this chemical reaction network. Uh, so this can be done for every species and we get a, a set of ODEs as you can see uh, in red in the left hand side. So in the chemical reaction network, you can see uh, K1, K minus one and K2 on top or below the arrows. These are the so-called rate constants, and roughly speaking, they described the pace of the reactions. So meaning uh, the reaction pace can change depending on many things, for example, the pressure, the temperature, and many things that can happen in the reaction environment. And those things are, somehow can be described by uh, these KIs. So what I am not going to explain in detail, but have in mind is the so-called uh, mass action kin kinetics. Uh, so all these things, these polynomials that I am describing happens under the so-called mass action kinetic kinetics. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of that. So having associated a, um, a set of ODEs and sub polynomials to a given reaction network, chemical reaction network, one can now study these uh, ODEs or polynomials in order to understand the properties of the chemical reaction networks. 
And this is how many problems in chemical reaction network theory boils down to computer algebra. So the ideal that is generated by the polynomials uh, in the right-hand side of the OB is the blue ones. This ideal is called the steady state ideal of the chemical reaction network. In this particular case, it is uh, generated by FS, FP, FC, and minus FC, which comes from uh, the change of the concentrations of E. Um, so this is a polynomial ideal with variables S, P, C, E, and the so-called parameters K1, K minus one, and K2. The coefficients of the polynomials usually are integers. So again, since I didn't explain how we get these polynomials, you didn't see this, but that's what happens. So the field, the, the ring of polynomials in which we are working is usually um, R of Ki's and then variables. In this particular case, I, I just mentioned K as a field of the coefficient just to have a general picture of this. So the um, zeros of this ideal are called the steady states. Uh, and in particular, in reality, we are interested in the positive real zeros of this ideal. The variety that comes from this ideal, that is associated to this ideal, is called the steady state variety of the chemical reaction network. So, um, so the, the, the general goal, or one of the big goals in studying chemical reaction networks is to find these positive real zeros, or even to find out whether there exist such zeros and whether there exists more than one zero. So uh, as we know, just finding the real roots of a given set of polynomials is not uh, that easy, but of course it is an approachable problem. Uh, in reality, these polynomials can be big. Uh, they can have degrees of over 40. They can have variables that can be 56 or even more. So these numbers that I have written here refer to some models that we have taken from some biomodels repository which in reality have been have happened so uh, these numbers show that these are these are challenging problems for computer algebra but these are not unrealistic a natural idea to study these chemical reaction networks is to look at the uh, structures of the ideals or varieties associated with them and discover the properties of the chemical reaction networks by looking at those um, ideals um, and varieties. One of those uh, problems that people have considered uh, is the interesting problem of binomiality of the steady state ideal or toricity of the steady state variety. So this topic, this, this um, binomiality structure or toricity structure of this ideal of the ideal or associated variety is something quite historic, I have to say. So this comes from thermodynamics, it corresponds to the so-called uh, detailed balancing, in some cases complex balancing and so on. And this has been studied historically by Boltzmann, even Einstein and others very long time ago. Um, so the problem, as the name suggests, is whether the steady state ideal of a chemical reaction network is binomial or whether its variety is toric or not. So when we deal with the binomiality of an ideal, a standard tool from computer algebra that comes to my mind is Grobner basis. As we know, um, a given ideal is binomial if uh, for every uh, admissible ordering the reduced Grobner basis associated with that ordering contains binomials. So um, let me just clarify one thing that binomial ideals uh, for us in this talk is exactly an ideal that uh, can be generated by polynomials that have precisely two terms. So we do not consider, for example, a polynomial with one term monomial, we do not consider that binomial. Some authors have considered uh, have considered the binomial ideal to be an ideal that is generated by polynomials 
of at most two turns. So it's not the case for us. But anyway, in both cases, the argument with Grobner basis would work. One can just run Grobner basis and see if the reduced Grobner basis is binomial or not. So uh, this problem of binomiality or touristy has gotten out of attention within the last two decades. Uh, in particular, there is a very interesting work by Schnorfels, Frankenstein, and others called exactly toric dynamical systems, which investigates many interesting properties of uh, binomial or toric systems. And um, has some partial results on the so called global attract attract con conjecture. Uh, apart from the interesting work, there is um, a work by Wittgenstein and others um, on uh, testing toricity or binomiality of state state ideal or state state varieties uh, with uh, interesting criteria that work over the uh, certain matrices that come from the uh, um, chemical reaction networks. So there is a category of systems called messy systems introduced by Wittgenstein within, the, within, the, uh, within a couple of words, let's say, uh, that uh, include uh, basically the work on binomiality as well. So um, in CAS 2019, uh, we present the work about this topic. However, we had a geometric view towards the problem, meaning that we did not uh, work necessarily on the shape of the uh, generators of the ideal of on the binomiality of those, but rather we looked at the variety. We uh, try to investigate toricity as a geometric um, um, as geometric property, and uh, since this was a quite, uh, I would say, restricted topic for chemical reaction networks, uh, we looked at the so-called shifted toricity, which is often speaking the shift of uh, sh shift of the toricity of a toric variety. And this is inspired by a work of Gregorio van Neumann on um, resolution of singularities of binomial varieties. So in that test paper, we um, work both on real numbers and uh, C. We also use Grobner basis even over C uh, to, to check the uh, toricity. And we also use quantify elimination first order logic tool over the real numbers. Uh, which was our decision procedure for testing touristy and shifted touristy. Also, within last year, CAS, we uh, presented two work in this direction. One of them was a first order logic uh, approach uh, using English standards for testing touristy and shifted touristy again. On testing binomiality or particular uh, chemical reaction networks, we also presented the linear algebra approach, which was very fast. Uh, which included a very fast algorithm. It was basically polynomial time. Um, and also we introduced uh, another work, a graph theoretical algorithm, which had also a polynomial time for testing particular uh, set of chemical reaction networks. So what we are interested in this work is again, binomiality, but with a bit of different flavor. So let's have a look at this uh, Michaelis Manton uh, network that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, generated uh, for which the steady state ideal is generated by these four polynomials. So, first of all, the last polynomial Fe is just minus Fc, so we can just throw it away from the list of generators of I. Also, one can check that Fc itself is um, equal, is, is a linear combination of Fs and Fd. So the third polynomial is a combination of first and second polynomial. We can just throw that away from generators as well. So the same state ideal is basically uh, 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 generated by two polynomials, Fs and Fd. Now, one can try to reduce um, Fs with respect to Fd. And we get something like that, which looks like a binomial. However, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, these Ki's are parameters which are positive real numbers in reality, and therefore they can get values. The point is that here, if k minus one and k one have the same value, then the first term here vanishes and we get a monomial rather than a binomial. So this argument 
shows us that we should we should consider parametric studies of the steady state ideals in order to consider this this point of view of uh, having values for 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 the parameters in reality. This is uh, what, up to our knowledge, has not been considered until now in this area. And uh, of course, for the computer algebra community, uh, this obviously is what is using comprehensive Grobner basis for combinatorial called Grobner systems. Therefore, in this work, we use comprehensive Grobner systems as our tool to treat the binomiality problem of chemical reaction networks. So, I just very briefly and roughly uh, remind the definition of comprehensive Grobner systems. Uh, just emphasizing that this is not a work on comprehensive Grobner systems, and we are by no means experts on that, or we, uh, we do not work on this, but we just use it as a tool. So, what is a comprehensive Grobner system? So Consider I to be an ideal in the ring of polynomials with variables on X and parameters K. Uh, K is an algebraic, uh, algebraic extension of the field of coefficients K, call it L, algebraic closed extension. And assume that V1W1 to VRWR are algebraic subsets of Ln, and assume that G1 to GR are finite polynomials, uh, finite sets of polynomials that are subsets of our um, set of, uh, of our ring of polynomials. Now a triple uh, consisting, a set of triples consisting, consisting in VI, WI, and GI is called comprehensive Grobner basis for the ideal I and the union of VI minus WI if for every element of the algebraic set V and every specialization of the ring, the specialization of the, of the finite set of polynomials GI is a Grobner basis of the specialization of the ideal in L of X. So what does this specialization mean? So roughly speaking, assigning values to the polynomials assigning values basically to the parameters. Values come from the field. Oh, more precisely, it is basically homomorphism. Again, I don't go into the details of comprehensive Grobner basis for Grobner systems details. Um, so roughly speaking, we want the property of being Grobner basis to be preserved when we assign values to the parameters. So this is the point. Why do we do this? Because if we just compute, if we just ignore the values of parameters and compute the Grobner basis for the steady state ideal of a chemical reaction network, then after assigning values, we may, we may lose the property of having binomial, binomial generators or anything else, or even having a Grobner basis at all. So therefore, this is the right tool in order to study parametrically the chemical reaction networks. So um, in case that this V is the whole LM, uh, this uh, set G of triples is called the comprehensive Grobner uh, system of the ideal. And each of these triples are called a branch of G, a branch of the comprehensive Grobner system. So I do not put the definition of comprehensive Grobner basis here, but those who are in the field know that these are just uh, tightly related to each other and one can be obtained from the other one. I don't do this because we don't need it in our work. For this work, we just need comprehensive Grobner systems. So this topic, this, this concept of comprehensive Grobner basis for these systems have been introduced by Weiss Penning and uh, it has been developed uh, both in the algorithmic side and theoretical side by many people, uh, among which are um, Suzuki and Sati, uh, Montes, Kapoor, Derkani and Hashemi, and plenty of others that there's no space here, there's no room here to mention. I just would mention that in terms of implementations, we have used um, a, uh, the singular package GlobeCov which um, is based on, on, on Montes' work, our algorithm. And also we partially used a maple package implemented by Erkani and Hanshemi, which is based on Copper's algorithm for computing comprehensive Grobner systems. We chose these two because of the computational aspects of these two computer algebra systems. So um, 
He applied comprehensive Grobner systems on um, various models in order to test binomiality problem in particular. So one class of, of models, one class of chemical reaction networks that have been uh, considered in, uh, in the literature and is very important is the so-called enzyme phosphorylations, where N is a, a, a positive integer number. So I'm not going to mention what this looks like. I just can tell you that uh, depending on N, as N rises, these models can be very large and therefore the polynomials can be very large and computations can get hard. So this work, for example, had been this, this, this set of chemical reaction network had been considered by Wang and Sontag. And they have worked on the multi-stationarity of, of these chemical reaction networks, meaning whether they have more than one real positive uh, steady state, more than one real positive solution. So in that interesting work, um, a lot of computation has been done over the polynomials, over the ODs coming from the chemical reaction network. But the value of the, but the point that the value of parameters can change uh, has not been uh, considered because that's not the topic of that work. Also, this set of examples have been considered um, in the paper by Kinstein and her colleagues. And they use their interesting criteria in order to prove that uh, the steady state ideals of, uh, of these reactions are binomial or the varieties are toric. So both of these work are non-parametric. So the uh, KIs, uh, KIs are somehow treated like variables. Computations have been done and con conclusions have been uh, made based on, the con based on the computations that do not take into account the change of the possible uh, values of, of the parameters in some sense. So uh, going the same approach, we just did uh, a particular uh, set of reductions on the polynomials that come from this, um, this chemical, re these chemical reaction networks. And we showed that a steady state ideal can be reduced to a binomial ideal. So this is different from the work that is done in both of those above references, because uh, in those cases, they haven't checked this using, by using reductions as it is done in Grobner basis theory, but rather they have worked uh, other uh, interesting tools. Um, after checking this, we did parametric uh, studies, meaning we just uh, did comprehensive Grobner basis computations using singular package of, uh, of Montes, Grobkov, and we tried to compute and see uh, how, how often this happens that uh, the branches of the comprehensive Grobner system are binomial. So, um, to to, to some extent, it was surprising that um, not many branches of, of, of the comprehensive Grobner system computed were binomials. So as you know, the computations can get hard for comprehensive Grobner systems. And um, in this particular case, the uh, singular packages could compute the uh, comprehensive Grobner base for two phosphorylations and three phosphorylations in less than six hours. And the two last rows that you see in, in the table for four and five phosphorylations, uh, they did not finish in uh, six hours. Um, and even one of them did not finish in 10 hours. So um, the number of branches that were binomial were quite surprisingly low. Uh, what we tried to do was to use the Maple package, Maple Comprehensive Group Nervous package of uh, Dehkani and Hashemi uh, to check further the binomiality because the difference between the package that they have, uh, or their algorithm, I would say, is that lots of these branches of Comprehensive Group Nervous can have uh, trivial Grobner basis. I mean, they, Grobner basis can be one, and they delete those. They just delete those branches. So we were interested to see, you know, in, in seeing whether whether the so many branches that are not binomial, they include 
uh, just one or not. So unfortunately, the computations with that package was very slow. So uh, we, we did not make uh, other strong conclusions because the computations did not go that far. I must mention that the um, uh, systems that we have used for, for our computations are definitely are good enough. Uh, so um, other than this, we carried out computations um, on a large set of uh, biological models coming from a repository of biomodels. We checked a number of binomial branches. We computed the comprehensive Grobner basis. So some of these models had plenty of branches, actually. So this is not the complete list of the models, but this gives a good glimpse of uh, how, how, how the models uh, look like in terms of binomiality of the branches of comprehensive Grobner basis. So um, again, in contrast to our intuition from previous work that we expected many branches to be binomial, uh, it seems that just in few cases, uh, majority of the branches are binomial. So in most of the cases, actually very few of the branches turned out, branches of the comprehensive Grobner basis turned out to be binomial. Uh, still, this uh, should not be taken in contrast to any other work because this is a parametric study over the branches and lots of these branches can be one, while the other studies are, are, uh, are non-parametric studies. So yeah, I conclude my talk just mentioning that this uh, work has been supported by the Symbion project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so what, what do you mean by a non-parametric study? So, yeah, so what do I mean by that is it's look at, let's say, comprehensive Grobner basis, exactly. So let's look at this. Um, so this is, this is the first sequence, a binomial, uh, a binomial, okay? But if we evaluate K minus one and K one, or more precisely, if we, if we have a homomorphism from a set of KIs or the ring of K of K one KI to a field, let's say an extension of K, and you put the values here, then if the value of K minus one and K one are equal, then the first term will be killed. Okay, so we have mm -hmm. only one term here. This might happen in reality in a reaction uh, because it may, it may be that in some instance, the parameters, the rate constants, K minus one and K one have the same value. And in that instance, that term will be killed, okay? So yeah. this is what I mean by parametric study. I have another question. So, well, in this case, you see that you already have a, a monomial like K2 times C. You already know that it's going to be, you're, you're going to have monomials all the time, but this is not my question. My question is, uh, in, a, in, in these applications, what is important are the parameters are positive. You cannot ask for positive, but at least you can ask for non-zero. Are you asking that the parameters are non-zero? This could um, simplify the computations. Yes, we do ask for, for the parameters to be non-zero, and it can happen that they can be non-zero positive reals and kill each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I also have a question. Does this approach apply to chemical oscillators? Like, for example, the belousov jabatinsky reaction? Oh, I, I am not aware of those. Uh, so I do not know what you mean exactly by that. Well, the, the chemical oscill oscillators uh, are a reaction which is uh, quite far away from the steady state and which might behave almost chaotically. So which does not converge to an equilibrium state in any reasonable time. Like the Bellows of Jabotinsky is one of the most well-known examples. Is it possible to treat such a case by means of this European basis technique? Uh, I, I have not studied that, but that sounds very interesting to me. But unfortunately, I haven't, uh, I haven't considered that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, let's, let's thank the speaker.
again. And uh, the next talk is given probably again by the same speaker and uh, the title is uh, uh, Parametric Tericity of Steady State Vari Varieties of uh, Reaction Networks. Okay. Yes, thank you. I just uh, again share my screen. So, so um, yes, this is um, this talk is the second talk will be quite similar in the sense that the problem that he approaches uh, very very close to the problem that uh, I mentioned in the previous talk with the difference uh, in uh, not only somehow in the problem itself, but mainly in the approach of this work. So um, essentially I have very similar or the same introduction for this talk. So this talk, in this talk we look at the toricity problem that I somehow explained in the previous talk partially rather than binomiality problem. So this talk is based on the geometric uh, property rather than the algebraic property that I mentioned in the previous work. Uh, again, same, um, um, uh, let's say same setting somehow. Uh, so I have to go through the introduction in case someone has missed the previous talk. So um, again, we are just going to use computer algebra tools in biosciences, which is important and emerging field, as I mentioned. Um, so um, many tools from computer, from computer algebra are going to be used, are, you, are used, have been used, are going to be used in, in chemical reaction networks and biological systems. And of course, the central tool um, is uh, the autonomous, autonomous ODEs that are obtained from uh, or associated to the chemical reaction networks and biological systems. So I have a, a I have an example here that is different from the previous talk, which is the one side phosphorylation. So this is the uh, reaction network that you can see here. Uh, it includes um, so if you don't remember the previous talk, well, uh, this is just a fresh example, uh, nothing to do with that one. But if you know that this is very close to that reaction somehow. Um, but anyway, so we have a reaction system, reaction networks here, and then we have ODEs that are associated to those. So X1, X2, X3 to X6 here uh, are the concentration of these species in this uh, reaction. And um, they just associate, they're associated to S0, E, ES0, and so on. And then certain polynomials can describe within the so-called mass action kinetics, can the poly sorry, certain polynomials can describe uh, these ODEs. Uh, so we have uh, K cat K on K off L on L off L cat as the uh, rate constants of these uh, reactions. Uh, they are positive real numbers explicitly and uh, or they can take values from positive real numbers. And uh, they, in terms of reactions, they describe uh, how fast or how slow the reactions can happen uh, in a way. Um, so the polynomials that we associate to the, uh, uh, to, to, uh, the um, concentration of the species or the change of the concentration of these species uh, are polynomials in terms of xi's, which are the variables that show the concentration of the species, and l cat l on l off, k cat k on k off, are so-called parameters of this um, polynomial system. Then the coefficients in this case are just plus minus one, but in general they can be integers within this setting. So we are dealing with an ideal, which is generated in this case by F1, F3, F4. Well, in general, it is generated by six polynomials, one for each OD, one for each species here. But in this particular case, it turns out that the three other polynomials are linear combination of these three polynomials, F1, F3, F4. Therefore, I avoid them here. So the ideal generated by these is called the steady state ideal. 
And in this talk, this is an ideal in variables x i's and parameters k on off or k i's in general. Um, so the coefficient here I have written k, but in this work we consider the coefficient field to be r very precisely. So this work, as I said, will deal with the geometry properties and I and will use um, logic tools. And we work exactly on R star, the um, uh, non-zero real numbers and actually positive real numbers for algebraic treatment of the polynomials that we have previously for using Grobner base or comprehensive Grobner basis, we relied on C partially because we needed sometimes an algebraic to cross field. So the variety of this ideal is called the steady state uh, variety and each point in the variety or each solution of this system is called the steady state, which, which, which kind of shows the uh, equilibrium in the system, which means that for which, uh, for which value of the, for which concentration of the species, the system reaches to an equilibrium. So um, therefore, a big goal is to solve but the real solutions solve the system and find the real solutions of uh, positive real solutions of the system. So again, uh, from the bio model uh, repository, I picked up a system with 90 polynomials with 71 variables and try to find its solutions, uh, real or even non-real with, with um, uh, well known computer algebra. Uh, methods or systems, and of course, this is not uh, that easy. But still, uh, there are there are um, approaches via computer algebra to such problem. So, of course, we want to study and uh, discover uh, particular structural properties of those models. And one way to do that is to look at the either binomiality of the steady state ideal or toricity of the steady state variety. So this is again historic work. This comes from uh, work done by Einstein and others in the last century. And uh, as the name of uh, the problem, binomiality or even toricity suggests, Grobner basis is the tool to use to uh, test toricity of the state state ideal or, uh, or, or, or um, sorry, toricity of the state state variety of the binomiality of the state state ideal. So again, literature within the last two decades is pretty rich. Among the um, most important ones I just mentioned, um, again, the paper called Toric Dynamical Systems, which treats the toricity problem um, extensively and has very interesting results. Also, again, I mentioned the, the work by uh, the work on messy systems, which is which includes a large uh, large uh, category of chemical reaction networks, uh, which have very interesting properties, and the the origin originate somehow from toric systems. And um, there is interesting work of um, there's this interesting work on stoichiometry metrics and other matrices. You know, to obtain information about the binomial toricity of the uh, chemical reaction networks. And uh, linear al algebra approaches are used, which are fast and very interesting. So again, we try to have a geometric view. We try to look at the varieties rather than uh, uh, binomiality in CAS 2019 paper. We looked at the toric varieties uh, corresponding to the uh, chemical reaction networks. So it turns out toricity is a strong condition. So we looked at the shifted toric ones, and it turns out that there are many, many biological models that have shifted toric structure. And um, just to roughly mention, which I will uh, explain in detail, the shifted toric variety for us is just the shift of a toric variety, or more precisely, it's the coset of a group, of an algebraic group. Uh, so it is the coset of a toric variety. So again, if one wants to use algebraic tools, such as Grobner basis over C, well, there are there are well-known methods to do that, but there are restrictions. Over real numbers, we use first-order logic tools, 
We critically use quantifier elimination uh, for, for our investigations of biological models. And last year, CASC, we had a new national as a base approach, uh, first order logic approach, in order to taste touristy uh, and shift the touristy of biological models and chemical reaction networks. And another work that we presented at CAS last year was a linear algebra approach. It was uh, focused on a particular set of chemical reaction networks, which were uh, uh, reversible chemical reaction networks. So that somehow limits the, uh, the scope. However, the output was very impressive in the sense that there was a linear algebra uh, approach with polynomial time uh, um, complexity algorithm. And the experiment shows a drastic uh, difference between the, the computation times with this uh, approach and well-known, let's say, broadener based approach. We also presented, uh, we also um, uh, worked on a graph theoretical algorithm, very similar to the linear uh, algebra algorithm, and actually with very similar complexity, uh, again, directed towards reversible chemical reaction networks. So, this work, as the title suggests, is a parametric studies, uh, which means that when we are looking at the ring that I mentioned uh, with parameters ki and variables xi, we really want to distinguish ki's from xi's. So uh, in the previous work that I mentioned, none of the work has considered this. Meaning that, for example, binomiality is tested by just computing Grobner basis of the ideal, considering the ideal with variables ki's and xi's, and then testing the binomiality of that, and perhaps doing, in some cases, elimination of the variables. So that's different from the parametric studies, meaning that if we just assign values to the parameters, then within the computation, things can change. So binomial or whatever property that we may obtain can, can be just uh, damaged, can be just collapsed. So um, talking about geometry, we just focus on toric and shift toric varieties. So what is a toric variety? Again, for mathematicians, for example, Fulton's book, toric variety is an irreducible subgroup of a multiple group, and it is normal. So in this talk, we don't consider normality. We just ignore that. So for us, toric varieties are irreducible subgroups of, in this particular case, R star N as a multiple group. What are shifted toric varieties? They are irreducible cosets of R star N, cosets of a subgroup of R star N. So they are basically the cosets of a shifted variety. Uh, where do we take these things and how are they related to the binomial ideals? So the variety of a binomial ideal um, includes one toric variety and several shifted toric varieties as its irreducible components. So this is something well known. And actually in a work by uh, Wilman and Grigoriev, they have tried to do some particular resolution of those varieties. So they called such varieties with binomial ideal uh, as binomial varieties. And then their uh, irreducible components are toric or shifted toric. So for the biomodels, as we are looking at the um, at this geometric structure, we are interested to see whether they are toric or shifted toric in this sense. So the example that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the one side phosphorylation, so for that, we treated this parametrically. So I'll explain uh, our tool a bit later. But just to show you the uh, solutions or how they look like. So the steady states uh, ideal, the steady state variety uh, is non-empty. Again, we are working on uh, positive overall positive real numbers. And one such solution has been discovered with our tools, which was quantifier elimination. And as you can see on the denominator, we get on the denominator of the fractional numbers, we get, uh, we get basically um, parameters, which can get values. But since we are working over positive real numbers, none of these produce any problem. And this exactly shows that over positive real numbers, there exists at least one solution. Okay. 
Uh, also for this one site phosphorylation, we precisely uh, checked parametrically that this variety is shifted toric, meaning that for every choice of K, it is shifted toric. So if you assign values to these K cap, K of K on, the shifted toricity doesn't change. The uh, coset structure is there and it doesn't change. However, for the steady state variety for being toric, uh, that's not the case. For some values of K, the structure can collapse. We may not have a toric variety anymore. But we discovered this condition using quantified elimination, uh, such that if the condition holds, the steady state variety is toric, is a group. So the group structure is, is preserved under these conditions if we just evaluate uh, uh, these parameters. So the problem of this work was testing parametrically toricity or shifted toricity of the steady state varieties of chemical reaction networks. So which tool did we use quantifier elimination? So in order to use quantifier elimination, I just showed some simple formulation, first order logic formulation of uh, a variety to be, in this particular case, a steady state variety to be, to be a concept to be shifted toric. So this is just first order logic formulation of being a coset. So what do we need? We need to cause it to be non-empty, first of all. We need it to be closed under, under inverse. We need it to be closed under multiplication. Uh, so being just writing down these things and expanding in the semi-formal way, let's say. So being closed under inverse is that if we have a cofactor of the coset G, and a member of the cofactor, then gx minus one should be a member of this uh, of this uh, coset as well. So this is just a simple definition. Again, the same for multiplication. G is essentially looking from above. G is the cofactor. Gx and gy are two members of of this coset, and therefore we expect gxy to be a member of the coset as well. So. Um, so in our previous work, um, we used quantifier elimination, but we did not consider parameters Ki in our formula, uh, meaning that we just either had values for Ki's, for example, in my model repository, there are plenty of models for which the value of these rate constants are clearly written down. So we have just polynomials in X, use quantifier elimination, for example, and the output is either true or false for testing touristy or shifted touristy over the real numbers. Or uh, we consider KIs as parameters, as sorry, variables. And again, we have a bunch of coefficients and we have a bunch of variables, but no parameter, nothing to change. And then again, we could test touristy or shifted touristy and we have either true or false as a result of our quantifier elimination. And those were the essence of work that we did uh, during CAS 2019 and 2020. Now, when we want to study the parametric case, k's are free variables here. So in our logical formula, x's are the bounded variables and k's are free variables. So our logic formula, for example, for um, Shifted toricity will be, a, will be a conjunction of these things. And we have a bunch of quantifiers. What do they quantify? The variables xi, but k's are the free variables. Therefore, our quantifier elimination procedure would establish exact formula conditions on k, not uh, uh, by, just, by just eliminating x. But k's are present as a result of our quantifier elimination. And those are precisely the conditions that we want over the parameters so that some property, let's say toricity or shifted toricity, hold on the chemical reaction networks. So our decision our procedure in this um, logical approach, in this first logical approach is, of course, real quantified elimination. So what is real quantified elimination? Just to quickly mention. So let's say we are given phi, a first order formula. Quantifier elimination computes another formula called phi prime, such that phi and phi prime are 
uh, essentially um, um, agrees that five over, over the ring R, but phi prime does not contain any quantity. So in this particular case of uh, Shapi touristy, our phi would be conjunction of these four things up there. The quantifiers will quantify X i's. The output phi prime will be a formula in terms of K i without those X i, without quantifiers. Okay. And those are exactly the conditions that we require on the parameters so that the property of say toricity or shifted toricity holds. So just again to mention briefly a few things about quantifier elimination without going into the depth of what it does, because we, we do not. So this is not a work on quantifier elimination. This is just a use of quantifier elimination for, for testing toricity or shifted toricity. So for an existential formula, like shifted toricity that we have, which is, which is a conjunction of those conditions, those, those formula that I mentioned um, previously. The quantifier elimination procedure computes a formula that uh, it provides us necessary and sufficient conditions in K uh, for the existence of choices for X that satisfy the shifted uh, toricity. Um, so, in general, quantifier elimination does not or is not required to drive any solution for X or drive any information on the possible choices of X. But there is a so called virtual sub substitution uh, that can optionally provide sample solutions for X. Uh, so, this thing is called uh, extended quantifier elimination. And this is what we have used uh, in our computations in order to to test uh, parametrically the uh, touristy and shifted touristy. So um, for example, for enzyme phosphorylations, we used quantifier elimination. And uh, we can show that, uh, first of all, the steady state variety is non-empty for whatever choice of the parameters. Okay. Um, apart from that, uh, we also obtain a uniform witness in terms of the parameters, and this is done by the extended quantifier elimination by virtual substitution, as I said. Then uh, we can show that the enzyme phosphorylations are shifted toric for all values of the parameters. We can check those closer properties, okay, and whatever values the parameters uh, take, the closeness will be uh, preserved. However, for toricity, the same as uh, one side for solution that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, that's not always the case. But the condition that is required are over the parameters so that toricity holds for inside phosphorylation is conjunction of these conditions. For one side phosphorylation, basically we didn't have the conjunction because we had just yeah, this one single uh, one single I actually. So um, Let's see how good the computations are. So we used a red log package of reduced computer algebra system, which has been developed by, by Thomas Rutton. Uh, so for all n one to five values of enzyme phosphorylation, we could compute in less than six hours the result of the quantifier, quantifier elimination. Uh, for n greater than or equal to six, it took more than six hours, but still uh, this is very powerful and we compute a lot of cases. As you can see, for example, when n is five, the number of parameters is 30 and the number of variables is 18. So the, the formula, the, the polynomials are really large. Okay. So just to compare uh, with the comprehensive Rodner system computation that I mentioned in the previous talk using singular, um, within six hours, we only could check the binomiality of the branches of comprehensive Grobner systems of n-side phosphorylation for n equal to two and three. So for n equal to four and five, the comprehensive Grobner system computations did not finish in uh, six hours. And uh, which was not a surprise because we know the comprehensive Grobner system computation takes quite a lot of time. Uh, so this comparison might be um, not 100% fair because we do not compute exactly the same thing, 
but still this shows this shows the power of the computations using quantifier elimination in comparison with a uh, comprehensive Kovner basis as well. So again, this work is uh, supported by the Symbion project. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And questions, please. Uh, can we uh, go to the last uh, slide of yours? Yep. Yes. Uh, so what is the exact correspondence between the top table and the bottom one? Uh, is the uh, n? So, uh, so n's are the same. So when I talk about n side mm -hmm. phosphorylation, n is integer called the integer number. So it is this n in the left column here, one, two, four, five, and so on. And here again, this is two phosphorylation. This is n is two, mm -hmm. three, four, five, and so on. Okay. So what I have here in the uh, upper uh, table is the number of parameters, variables, number of polynomials that show up, and number of quantifiers in each formula for this shifted touristic. I do not have them in the in the uh, column below, but of course the time also yeah shows the corresponding computation time. Yep. But basically, you solve the same problem here, right? So for n, for instance, for yeah, this is again a difference between toricity and binomiality, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so the, the comprehensive problem basis checks whether a given ideal. Uh, has a binomial comprehensive Grobner system, meaning that in each branch it checks whether the reduced Grobner basis is generated by exactly binomials, while the one up there checks the property of uh, a, let's say, the, so algebraically toric's, toric stuff are, or shifted toric, are by, uh, generated by binomials, but not by every binomial. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is not exactly the same thing uh, from a mathematical point of view. But for your particular purposes, uh, the first method via quantifier elimination is much uh, better. So yeah, is, since is we do not exactly compute the same objects, uh, the comparison might be a bit rough. But mm -hmm. we know, for example, that there is a big difference between the complexity of Grobner basis computation and, and quantifier elimination, right? So quantifier elimination can be just a single exponential, right? So uh, while Grobner basis can be um, yeah, in double or triple exponential, uh, fixed with space, whatever. Yeah. So maybe to be more precise, uh, do you need to compute uh, some residual information uh, when, when you use the f first method? Quantifier elimination. What do you Which mean by I mean, I mean, you said that uh, these methods are not uh, exactly the same uh, in terms of uh, uh, what what objects uh, you receive uh, in the output. So uh, my question is uh, uh, for your. For your purposes, uh, the method of quantifier elimination gives you complete information. You don't uh, you don't need to compute anything extra when comparing to oh. Grobner basis, which, for instance, yes, uh, that's mm -hmm. true. That's true. So that that's true. Yes, we do not need, in that sense, we do not need the residual information, mm -hmm. as you said, or residual mm -hmm. uh, computations, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. All right. But then again, mm -hmm. if one wants to go to the details of the connections between comprehensive Grobner based and quantified information, that would be, I think, a quite a thorough topic to to mm -hmm. to discuss. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Which is concerned more. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. So, if I am pretty sure, I need to check this, but if I remember well, <coughs> in fact, you can check that these systems are <laughs> defined by binomials only doing operations over R or over K, whatever. You, you don't need to use monomials, it's just completely linear algebra questions. So, no monomial over the, let's say, over the complex numbers. You just 
do linear uh, elimination, standard Gaussian elimination, and then you get binomial. So you replace each monomial by a variable and you get your answer. So this should be much, much quicker in this case than what you are doing. Yeah, so this, so... Is, this would be a case in which understand in, when this is the case, it shows that all this machinery is not so useful when you can go in, in a more direct and easy way. Yeah, I, 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 I think I, I particularly address this, uh, this, this point because um, uh, in the previous talk, for example, I mentioned that just by doing reduction, reducing the polynomials, like reduction as defined within group basis, one can reduce the monomials or polynomials with it, each other and can reach to a binomial system. However, mm -hmm. What is missing is parametric uh, computation, meaning that uh, these operations that we do. So what you mentioned was, if I understood correctly, yeah, those monomials even can be, uh, monomials are different from each other. One can just uh, assign variables or associate variables to each of them, and then one can do linear algebra, Gaussian elimination. Right, but uh, again, the question is, if you assign values uh, if you specialize the, uh, the parameters, these KIs, the procedure that you are describing may collapse. Some of those pivot points, for example, in your, your, your uh, metrics may be zero and you cannot use them anymore. And no, this no, is no, I understand that you need, a, you need a parametric way of solving the linear system, but it might well, be easier than doing this with the yeah, so maybe for, for this particular example, that's the case, but not for every chemical reaction network. No, no, I understand that in general it's not the case, but when this is the case, this might be much quicker than this general method via quantifier elimination or Gramner, comprehensive Gramner basis, basis, not knowing anything about the particular structure which makes your system easier. Right, sure. Um, if if the system is in such a way that one can do parametric Gaussian elimination, it might be, although, of course, that requires a bit of investigation to see what is the complexity of parametric Gaussian elimination and uh, also uh, what happens in practice when implementations are done. I think there are there is work on that and there are ongoing work on that. Maybe you can go one. for bigger values of n this way. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a question, which is concerned more with the first part of your talk, rather than the second one. And it's a bit vague, but suppose that you pick a model in the biomodels database or in the Symbiont project, a biological or maybe a chemical model, and suppose that uh, there is an invariant variety in the space of parameters of your model, or whatever it is. And suppose that this invariant variety is moreover an attractor. Now, if we pick an initial point for your system, uh, then we expect to have some convergence towards a point, or maybe some subset of the invariant variety. And my question is, do you typically assume that this convergence is exponential? Or is it maybe always exponential? Or can it be much slower than the exponential? Yeah, so in this work, I do not, uh, I do not, I haven't considered uh, the interesting, uh, interesting issue that you are mentioning. So we, we essentially haven't considered that and just done the work of parametric computations, uh, whether com comprehensive program based or, or real point fire elimination. Um, but I think the experts might point uh, on, on that attractor uh, issue. I, I, I cannot because yeah, this, this work is essentially, um, it does not, really, uh, does not really consider that. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? If not, let's send the speaker again. And uh, now we have a coffee break for approximately half an hour and we go back here, get back here uh, at 5 p.m. local time. Thank you.
All right, dear colleagues, we are ready to proceed with our afternoon session, five o'clock in the evening, and uh, I would like to uh, present the speakers of the next of our next talk tonight. Uh, it's Matthew Emery, Francois Fagues, and uh, Sylvian Solomon. Um, the talk is a polynomialization algorithm for elementary functions and ODEs and their compilation into chemical reaction networks. Okay, okay th thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, so uh, this is a joint work indeed with uh, Mathieu and Sylvain. Uh, they are in my group at Inria Saclay. And uh, uh, the talk is about um, some uh, polynomialization algorithm we have uh, designed uh, for elementary uh, mathematical functions and uh, ODEs, and uh, that we use uh, to uh, compile uh, such uh, mathematical uh, functions into uh, chemistry, into chemical reaction network. Uh, so we want to use them as specifications of the behavior of uh, system of molecular interactions in the perspective of systems biology to understand how uh, cells implement high level functions in terms of molecular species interactions. And in the perspective also of um, synthetic biology in order to implement uh, such uh, behaviors uh, with artificial vesicles. So, uh, CRN are um, uh, uh, a standard formalism I'm using. I'm sorry, uh, uh, excuse me, we cannot, uh, we, we see blank screen, maybe. Uh, uh, really? Do I understand? Yeah, yeah. You don't see the slides, okay? Yeah, just blank screen. Uh, uh, yes, is it better? Okay. Yes, 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 now. Okay, can so uh, I will, uh, I will uh, keep like that, perhaps just uh, uh -huh. uh, hide the pen, perhaps, yeah. Okay, so I will I will do present them uh, this uh -huh. way. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, a CRN is a finite set of uh, formal reaction rules of uh, some uh, set of uh, molecular species. Each reaction is um, defined by a multiset of reactants uh, the multiplicity is given by so-called stoichiometric coefficients, a multiset of products, and a right function uh, on the molecular quantities of the of the reactants and the perhaps uh, inhibitors also of the reaction. So such a CRN has a graph structure of a petri net, and so this provides discrete semantics, but we won't speak about them today. Uh, the right functions also define uh, two continuous time dynamics, uh, the stochastic semantics by continuous time for Markov chains, and uh, the differential semantics by ordinary differential equations in explicit form uh, that is obtained uh, simply by collating for each molecular species uh, the sum of uh, the reaction rates for the reactions uh, for whichever produce or uh, consume as a reactant, uh, the molecular species Xi. And uh, so this uh, associates an uh, ODE system uh, to a CRN system. And in the case of mass action law kinetics, uh, we, uh, this leads to polynomial ODEs. And we are particularly interested in uh, elementary reactions, uh, which involve at most two reactants per reaction because uh, of collision theory. This is a realistic uh, elementary reactions. And in each case, uh, we have a quadratic uh, system of ordinary differential equations. So uh, we are computer scientists and uh, we want to uh, study uh, the notion of uh, functions computed by uh, such a CRN chemical reaction network. So first definition goes back uh, uh, to uh, what Shannon defined for the general purpose analog computer in the late thirties, in fact, where he said that uh, here for a CRN, we would say that the function F of a non-negative real numbers is generated by a CRN on some species Y of the CRN 
for some given initial concentrations. If the OVU system has a unique solution such that uh, y of t is equal to f of t. So y gives the trace of the function and at each time point you have uh, uh, f of t uh, this, uh, given by the concentration of y at time t. So that was the definition for uh, gener function generated by a GPAC or here for CRN, but this does not uh, match well in a, with the notion of computability, and so there was no good correspondence with Turing computability. And so uh, we um, uh, it took uh, quite a long time to uh, to, to defend the no uh, a different notion of functions computed by the GPAC that was done by Campagnolo and Grassa in the early uh, 2000. Uh, where we say that the function f uh, on non-negative real numbers here for a CRN is computed by a CRN for some input species x and uh, on some output species y and for some given initial concentrations for the other variable than x. If for any input uh, x of uh, zero at time zero, the ODE system has a unique solution which converges on y to the result f of x of zero. So this is the notion of function computed uh, f when the CRN does converge on y on the result f of x for any value input value x. And uh, uh, with this notion, uh, we can show a powerful result of uh, Turing com computability, which uh, for CRN states that any computable real function in the sense of um, computation by a Turing machine in arbitrary precision, as many digits as uh, we wish. Uh, so discrete computation by Turing machine. Such uh, a computable real function can be computed by a finite elementary CRN in that sense. So the proof relies on a very strong theorem by Bournais, uh, Grassa, uh, uh, Henry, and others uh, on the Turing completeness of polynomial ODE system, basically. Uh, for CRN, we also use the dual rail encoding of real variables as the difference of concentration between two positive variables. And uh, we use a quadratization uh, property also of uh, polynomial ODE systems in order to restrict ourselves to elementary CRN in this uh, comparison uh, process. So uh, this gives rise to an implementation we have developed in our uh, um, system uh, called the uh, Biochem, the Biochemical Abstract Machine. So it's a software platform for uh, systems biology and synthetic biology. And in particular, uh, we have a pipeline of compilation of mathematical functions into CRNs, where as input, we give uh, a fun uh, an elementary function of uh, ever of time or of some input species. And in the output, we get a finite chemical reaction network, elementary, network that compute that function ever of time so we generate it as a function of time or compute it as a function of some input x so along this pipeline we have the first step which is a formal derivation step where we derive uh, the function with respect to time so we get uh, ordinary differential equations for defining uh, that um, um, function a and um, then uh, we have a first step, uh, which is the main topic of my talk, which is about polyomial polynomialization, where we introduce auxiliary variable in order to get an equivalent ODE system, which is uh, defined with polynomials. It's a polynomial ODE system. Then if we want to compute uh, that function as a function of time, uh, the second main step is the quadratization. I will speak about also. And then from the quadratic PIVP, polynomial initial value problem, we know how to generate a finite CRN, which just mimic each monomial of degree at most two uh, with um, uh, reactions. 
And uh, we ensure uh, this property that we do compute uh, the function f uh, as a function of time on the concentration of uh, molecular species A. And if we want to compute a function of some input species X, uh, we have a kind of trick uh, which uh, consists in uh, considering uh, the OD system for computing uh, the function as a function of time, but then we somehow alter the system at the time x. So for that, we have an exponential decrease of uh, x. Um, x is uh, initialized uh, with the input uh, value uh, for which um, we want to compute the function, and we multiply all the terms of the ODEs uh, by x. And uh, this uh, will uh, uh, ensure convergence uh, to, toward the um, f of x for a and uh, we have the same uh, quadratization uh, step if we want to restrict to elementary reactions uh, from this ODE system. So how does it look like on some examples? For instance, if we want to uh, compute uh, that function, a of t is a log of one plus t square, we will uh, synthesize uh, CRN, this one, uh, that will compute it. So it will introduce uh, two auxiliary variables, bt and b, initialized respectively to zero and one. And then we have a reaction here, uh, which shows that uh, bt is a, catalysis, uh, a, a catalyst for the synthesis of A. Uh, bt is also a catalyst for the degradation of B. Uh, B is a catalyst for the uh, synthesis of bt or activation of bt. And BT is an autocatalyst for its own degradation. Nothing very intuitive here, but it does compute exactly uh, that function of time uh, on molecular species A. So how do we uh, proceed for that? First step is a formal derivation. So we, we get uh, this expression, which is not polynomial. So second step is uh, the polynomial, uh, uh, polynomialization algorithm uh, uh, we, we use. So for that, we introduce basically new variables for the non-monomial terms, like here on this uh, division, uh, and we do formal derivation. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, we end up with a polynomial term. Uh, in general, uh, we have to iterate the process of introducing new variables for, for, for those terms, uh, as long as they are not uh, monomial or not polynomial. Um, and uh, so we end up uh, with this uh, polynomial OD system, but which is not quadratic here. You have a term of degree three. So the second main step is the quadratization. So here the idea is to um, introduce uh, an auxiliary variable BT, the product of B by T, and this will allow us to remove T. And now we have a quadratic systems and um, we derive a BT and we end up again with a quadratic system for um, uh, the derivative of BT. And so uh, basically these reactions mimic uh, those quadratic ODE system. For instance, for A, we have this um, uh, term, um, synthesis of A as uh, by, by 2BT uh, with this reaction, uh, coefficient two for the mass action law kinetics uh, with reactant BT, which is just a catalyst. BT is not affected uh, by this reaction. It is affected by uh, another reaction with BT and, and B uh, here, which is this one. Okay. If uh, we want to compute uh, the same function, but not as a function of time, but as a function of the input species X, um, we shall uh, um, produce uh, this CRN uh, with uh, one, two, sorry, uh, one, uh, two, two uh, auxiliary variables, BX, TBX. They have uh, X is also for the input. We have degradation rules uh, with mass action locutics everywhere uh, and uh, some uh, catalytic, uh, catalytic rules, uh, reaction rules for uh, the auxiliary variables. 
And so we proceed in the same way here. First, uh, derivation steps. Then polynomialization by introduction of um, new variables for the non-polynomial uh, terms. And um, uh, up to uh, we, up to the time we get a polynomial ODE system. And then uh, here it's again uh, of uh, degree three with this term here. So quadratization phase uh, obtained here by introducing dx and t dx variables and removing t and b. And we get uh, that quadratic system, which uh, gives uh, this um, CRN. So the algorithm for polynomializing uh, our elementary uh, ODE systems um, takes as input uh, an ODE system uh, and as output uh, a finite set of uh, polynomial ordinary differential equations uh, which uh, preserve um, the, the, the solutions of the initial system of the same variables because they do introduce uh, more variables. So uh, this algorithm uh, basically uh, maintain uh, uh, on, uh, substitution, a set of substitutions to apply to replace terms by uh, variables representing them and uh, construct iteratively a polynomial ODE systems. So uh, basically we look at a variable in the original ODE system, we compute its uh, derivative and we consider the set of maximal non-polynomial subterms of uh, that derivative. And then for each of them, we introduce a new variable, we compute its derivative and uh, we introduce, add to the ODE system, uh, these differential equations on the new variable on the, the derivative that has been computed. So termination is non-trivial. There is no obvious reason um, for, for which functions uh, it will terminate. And um, that, that will be what we, we will show, basically. And then uh, we, uh, at the end, uh, uh, we, um, uh, when we have uh, introduced variables for all the non-polynomial subterms, we um, we add uh, the uh, new variable uh, with its uh, differential function, uh, which is a polynomial, and uh, we iterate until the ODE set is uh, is, is uh, empty, and uh, the result is the QOD set. So for the termination, uh, we have a first uh, lemma, which says that um, the algorithm will terminate for any finite set f of formally differentiable functions over the reals whenever their derivatives belong to the algebra of f over r. Um, so uh, this is restricted to finite sets, but it means that we do not go outside f when we make the derivation. So necessarily we uh, will introduce a finite number of variables and uh, express our uh, ODE system in that way. And uh, very interesting for our purpose, uh, the algorithm does terminate on elementary functions of the variables with at most a linear number of new variables and quadratic time complexity for functions with linear size derivatives. So uh, for um, functions uh, with um, exponentials, we have to be careful for the negative powers. We do have to introduce uh, one over x as a, a new variable, and then we have a termination of uh, the, the process. And we can check for, for trigonomic trigonometric functions, and um, we can express them as polynomials uh, with um, a finite set of, um, of, um, of, uh, of candidates, and uh, this ensures uh, termination. So in a sense, uh, this solves our first step, uh, which allows us to compile uh, an elementary mathematical, mathematical function into uh, the solution of um, polynomial ODE system. The second step, which is uh, more costly uh, in our pipeline, is the quadratization. Uh, so it's well known that any function generated by a polynomial initial value problem, so POD system with initial values, 
can be generated by the IVP of degree at most two. So for instance, uh, Carotters uh, gave an algorithm in uh, D to the power N, N is the number of variables, D is the maximum degree of the variables in the original system. And uh, we can see that if we introduce uh, variables for all possible monomials that we can build on those variables with uh, the highest degree in the system, then uh, we are able, if we pay that price of introducing variables for all these possible monomials, um, then we are able to express the derivatives of uh, those uh, vari variables in terms of um, monomials of degree at most two in the set of those variables. So the output will be a quadratic PIVP on those variables. And the result uh, will be uh, on the first variable on which we get the result. Uh, so in the perspective of uh, generating CON, we want to minimize um, the number if we introduce variables. So if we look at that optimization problem, we call it uh, the quadratic transformation problem uh, with Carotter's monomials. So those kind of monomials, we want to minimize uh, the number of monomials, uh, Carotter's monomials we introduce. So uh, we want, uh, for the decision problem, for instance, we want to determine the minimum number K of uh, variables for Carotter's, Carotter's monomials such that uh, the uh, PRVP uh, defined on, on those monomials is equivalent to the original PRVP. And so that was uh, last year, we have shown um, that uh, that problem of uh, the decision problem for the existence of um, quadratic form of uh, with K variables uh, on uh, Carotter's monomial is in P complete in the non succinct representation of the PIVP that by the matrix of all Carotter's monomial. So even if we take that big input to represent uh, our PIVP, then we can encode, uh, in fact, the vertex set covering problem uh, as uh, such a problem of uh, uh, QTP in that non-succinct representation. So this shows, this shows the NP-completeness of the decision problem and the NPRness of the optimization problem. In practice, uh, of course, we work uh, with symbolic representation of uh, the PIVP, not the matrix of Carotter's monomial. And we conjecture that uh, that problem of um, computing optimal uh, quadratic form, minimizing the number of, of variables, is NX time complete in the non succinct representation. But we have no, pr no proof of that. So it's a complex problem and of importance for us. Fortunately, we can use uh, the MaxSat uh, solvers, uh, which provide some uh, pretty good results, especially with the heuristics, and we come back to it. Uh, so the idea is that we can encode uh, as a MaxSat problem um, uh, the, uh, the space of um, Carotos monomial by associating a Boolean variable to them. For each monomial, we compute uh, its derivative m prime. And uh, we also um, introduce um, variables for the different ways of uh, uh, representing um, the, the monomials of the derivative. So, for instance, if you want to, to have a representation for AB square, you will introduce a variable for it, and you will consider that you will represent it either with the variable AB square or as uh, the product of some variable for A on B square or for AB on B. And in that way, uh, your MaxSat algorithm will search for uh, representation of uh, your quadratization problem with Boolean variables. So uh, we ask that the variable we want to compute is present. For the optimization, we add soft clauses for negating each of a variable. So we will minimize the dimension of our result. And um, basically, we have a, so a clause to say that if a variable is present, uh, its derivative has also to be uh, represented by the conjunction of disjunction of uh, variables. So we have a way to encode um, with the MaxSat solvers uh, this problem. 
and uh, here are some results uh, we get. In fact, ever we use the MaxSat solver to solve the optimization problem for characters monomial, or we uh, we do that after using heuristic to restrict the subset uh, of variables. Uh, in order to, rest to restrict the subset of, um, to, to find a subset of Carotos monomial for which we know that we can do a poly, uh, poly, uh, quadratization, but uh, then we uh, do not guarantee that we preserve optimality. So we may have suboptimal solution. So this is what happens here. Uh, here it is after the heuristics, but the heuristics allows us to solve problems for which we, we get time out on uh, like a hill function for compiling. Uh, Hill function of order 10 or 20, we have a time out with the max sat optimization, but we end up with pretty good results very quickly when using max sat after the application of the heuristics on the universe of variables to consider. Uh, otherwise, sometimes we are suboptimal. And this line shows uh, that uh, obviously we have uh, several solutions for minimizing the number of uh, variables and the uh, happens that here we compute uh, better solutions in the number of reactions. We can also minimize the number of reactions in this approach. We can do it uh, both ways. So it's interesting to have a look at uh, uh, the synthesis uh, of uh, network for the hill file function because the hill file function has been shown to be the input output function of a very well known uh, signaling network in cells, the mitogen activated protein kinase uh, signaling network. It is in several copies in our cells and in all um, cells or all the carriers you have uh, this structure. It involves uh, 22 species, 30 reactions. It is in several copies, but the structure is this one. And uh, our synthetic analog uh, involves only seven species and 11 reactions for computing the same input output. But uh, these are formal species, so we have no reverse reactions. But if we want to implement them with real enzymes, probably we will have also those re reverse reactions to, to consider because they just exist. Uh, so this is not uh, shown here. And uh, also in our approach, uh, we do not do online computation. We consume the input, whereas MAPK uh, does not consume the input, just a catalyst. We know how to solve that problem now, but it's not uh, implemented uh, yet. And uh, probably this, uh, this synthetic network as it is, is probably also less, uh, less robust than the other one because of these um, inverse reverse reactions. So to sum up, uh, uh, I mentioned some open problems. Uh, in this pipeline for compiling uh, any elementary function in a finite CRN, we have more or less solved the problem of the first uh, phase of polynomialization. It's of uh, low complexity, uh, quadratic complexity, if we have uh, functions uh, with linear, linear size derivatives. Um, what remains uh, difficult is the quadratization phase. Uh, if we want uh, just to find a quadratic form, there is a simply exponential uh, but very costly algorithm on the quad brute force. Uh, if we want to minimize, we have shown that we end up with an NP complete decision problem in the non succinct representation. So, in fact, uh, our algorithm uh, uh, is doubly exponential. Uh, in the symbolic representation. Um, and uh, the good news is that we could manage to use MaxSat solvers which are pretty efficient on heuristics. Very interesting work, uh, recent work is by Gleb Pogodin and uh, Alexander Bishkov who show uh, that characters monomials uh, lead to suboptimal solutions if you go beyond uh, the degrees given by characters for the proof of the existence of a quadratic form. Uh, we can find better solutions, and they uh, design a branch and branch algorithm for that. Here, so very interesting in our case is a recent work by Aludin, which showed that if we introduce variable no longer for monomials only, but also for polynomials, uh, we can find even better quadratic forms. The problem is that we have no idea how to search for these uh, polynomial. Um, instead of monomial um, expression, 
um, that will minimize uh, the final quadratic form. So there is no algorithm for that. But for us, it's very important because when we want to implement a function, we want that the CRN um, be uh, we have at most two re reactants per reaction, but uh, we are agnostic on whether the variable we will introduce will represent a monomial or polynomial. Uh, it's just an auxiliary variable. And we would be very interested in uh, looking for uh, algorithm uh, for this problem, for these reasons. So I can stop here and uh, try to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Equations, please. Yeah. Can I ask? Uh, could you please comment yeah. on how often and when the uh, quadratization result fails? Um, what is the reason for a quadratization procedure to fail? Uh, so the quadratization uh, just uh, may take a lot of time because um, there are two reasons. Uh, first reason is that uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, monomials uh, to consider uh, if you consider Carotter's proof because you have to introduce uh, all these possible monomials. So this ensures the existence of a quadratic form. But you have a huge space, uh, and if you want to minimize uh, uh, your quadratic form, then you have to search for a subset in that huge universe. So uh, this is a very combinatorial problem. This is the reason. And uh, we have uh, so we have a heuristics, but uh, which preserve um, the possibility to find quadratic form, but uh, it does not preserve optimality. So we find suboptimal solution. And so it's a very combinatorial problem. And uh, NP completeness for finding the optimal solution was shown by uh, reduction of uh, vertex covering problem. So it's a really uh, combinatorial problem. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Alicia had a question. Yeah. So very interesting uh, talk, but I miss why you need to, this quadratization procedure. Okay. Which is so, the main point. So, Yes, this is because um, in a CRN, um, in the perspective of uh, synthetic biology, we want to implement uh, mathematical functions in chemistry and with elementary reaction. So an elementary reaction should have at most two reactants. Otherwise, we see it as a kind of reduction of a, of a more complex system. But if we take seriously uh, the implementation in chemistry of uh, our uh, CRN, it's uh, very natural to restrict to uh, reactions with at most two reactants, because otherwise it's not physically uh, very realistic to have uh, reactions with more than two reactants. So this is basically um, the reason why we are so much interested in uh, uh, elementary reactions with at most two reactants, and so so much interested in a quadratic polynomial ODE system. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and I'd like to ask my colleague Timur Sadikov to introduce our next speaker. Okay, dear colleagues, the final but the most important talk this afternoon will be given by Professor Alicia Dickenstein of the University of Buenos Aires, and she will give a distinguished invited lecture, the first distinguished invited lecture at this CASC meeting. As most of you know, Professor Alicia Dickenstein uh, is the winner of the prize of the World Academy of Sciences, the author of numerous books and also the former vice president of the International Mathematical Union. And the talk that will be given by her will deal on uh, families of polynomials in the study of biochemical reaction networks. So please, Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Timur. Uh, here. Can you see it? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. So I'm very happy to be participating of this meeting. I would be happier if we could all be in Russia. But okay, let's go on. I'm happy anyway. Maybe next time. So <clears throat> this is a small, um, I think you, you cannot read what is there in pale blue. But it is not important because this is just a, a summary of my of what I'm going to do. I will give a very quick uh, introduction to chemical reaction networks with mass action kinetics. Kinetics. We had something of this in the previous lecture. I will show you a particular biological network. I will define multi-stationarity and talk about circuits and uh, lower bounds coming from polyhedral subdivisions, and then I will very quickly uh, talk about other current and hopefully future computational approaches, and then uh, I will end. Okay, so the setting for this talk is that this, in general, this is bio, it, it, okay, there are chemical reaction networks, but my main focus are on those that come from biochemistry. Uh, they define system of ordinary differential equations with in general, general unknown parameters, as you have seen. <clears throat> the basic mathematical theory was developed by chemical engineers, uh, Horn, Jackson, and Feinberg in the, in the 70s. And uh, then stools from real complex algebraic geometry were started to be used by Karin Gatterman. She died very young in, uh, I guess, in January of 2005. But she made the link with this engineering community and mathematicians. And there is this standard assumption of mass action kinetics. But in so this is a realistic assumption when there are enough molecules and they are well mixed. Uh, in this case, we get families of polynomial ordinary differential equations with a combinatorial structure that comes from this directed graph of reactions. So here is a, an example. This is an example that comes from a paper in uh, immunology. It's an important paper. This is one of the, the simplest examples. In fact, there are more reactions like this. But so there, there are two here molecules or chemical species that bind together. What McKeithen was trying to understand is what, why is it that we, the, a T cell in, the, in our body can detect uh, a foreign antigen from a self. So it has to attack some molecules and not others that belong to us. How does it do it? So this, this, this cell receptor, it's bound uh, this, uh, with another uh, molecule. And then in a reversible process, it produces a molecule C. And then this molecule C, it's translated or transformed into another molecule D, and then it comes back. And it is this molecule D that then takes place in further reactions and reacts. And in fact, there is a chain, and this delay in producing is what allows the cell, according to Makitan, to give a, a good answer. So in this, the, the terminology is the following. These, there are four reactions. Each reaction is represented by one of these arrows. There are three complexes which are labeling the vertices of this directed graph. The complexes are A plus B, C, and D. This is monomolecular, this is bimolecular. And there are four species, A, B, C, D. But what we are going to do is what our real objects of interest are what are the concentrations of these different uh, molecules along time. So our, our um, variables are the concentrations which are indeed in functions of time. Excuse me. And so Just... mass action kinetics is, says that these functions will evolve according to this ODE system. So this, this is a vector, this derivative of the four uh, coordinates with respect to t. And this is for each four of these arrows, we get to go from here to there, we get K12. And then we take the product of the concentration of these molecules. This is because somehow the concentration is like the probability of the molecule being there. 
and it's like an assumption of independence. So we have the probability that the two of them occur is the product of the probabilities. Right? Then uh, this is why we get this monomial here. And this is multiplied, multiplying the vector. And the vector is the difference between this complex here and complex there. But what, what we do is we understand this complex. We think that A plus B, we have A, B, C, D, four coordinates. And so we're taking A plus B, we think that this is like having 1, 1, 0, 0, and this is 0, 0, 1, 0, and this is 0, 0, 0, 1. So we take the difference, and this is the vector. And we do the same for all the four uh, arrows. And we get this system of polynomial uh, differential equations, okay, which is quite mild, but you have these non-linear terms. Excuse me, just a quick question. This? May I please ask a quick yes. question on the model? Could you please comment on how universal this model actually is? Uh, to what kind of reactions does it potentially apply? Well, as I said, it, it applies to, it's a model that biochemists use. Yes. And it makes sense whenever there are enough molecules and when mixed. Okay, so just that. But otherwise, there are no restrictions, right? No, no, there are no restrictions. And, okay. and it's really, really widely used. Okay. okay. So, and there is something which is easy to see, is that if we add the... Here you see that mathematically there is no difference between A and B. We cannot say which is which, really except for the, they could have different initial conditions. But this means that if we look at the, the, the right-hand sides, I'm going to call F1 up to F4, it's easy to see that A, the, the F1 plus F3 plus S4 is equal to zero, and the same for F2 plus F3 plus F4. So we get two, so this means that the sum of the derivatives of these three uh, x's is equal to zero, this means that the sum of the axes is constant along a trajectory in a connected uh, interval uh, containing the origin. So this means that while we move in a, in a connected uh, interval, then this quantity has to be constant and this quantity has to be constant. This means that trajectories lie in R4, but in fact, they lie in a two plane in four dimensional space. And these total amounts, T1 and T2, are determined by the initial conditions. Okay? So in general, what we have is we start with a set of reactions, which are edges which are going to label, label with these positive real numbers, which are called reaction rate constants. There will be M complexes, which will give rise to monomials in a set of S species, this will give us these S variables. So for instance, in our case, we had one, one, zero, zero. This is what we have X A times X B. So in general, a chemical reaction network, <coughs> sorry. So <coughs> find a directed graph with vertices leveled by complexes, edges leveled by parameters, and we view this concentration as functions of time. And the system of ODEs has this shape. So for each arrow, we get a monomial times this positive constant times, and this is a column vector. This is the difference of two non-negative integer vectors. So we get here an integer vector. So this is the shape. And so it is easy to see that these are monomials with real coefficients, that the sign depend on the combinatorics of the graph. It is also easy to see this way that for each linear reaction rea relation, sorry, among the vectors y, j minus y, i, we get linear relations. <clears throat> sorry, I have a problem with my voice. Let me take a little more. I was trying to say that linear relations among these vectors give linear relations among the Fs, the ones that, for instance, we saw a moment ago. And the total amounts are determined by the initial conditions. It could be other relations. And in fact, there is a nice theorem that Harsh and Todd 
uh, to Hungarian mathematicians that, that explain which polynomials f uh, arise in this way. I don't have time to say it, but it's easy. But for instance, chaotic Lorentz equations are not of this shape, but many models in popular in population dynamics as the lotka volterra model, which give this oscillation behavior are of this form. So, but in general, the models in chemistry have complexes with high integer powers in, with high coordinates, but in, in biochemistry, in general, the exponents are very really bigger than two because these are big molecules and it's hard for them to interact and to form a complex. So it's, it's very particular if you can just can assemble three. So in general, we have small coordinates, but in general, they are nonlinear. So the general goal, what we would like to have is the following. We would like to uh, start with a reaction network and provide the black box, which just splits properties of the reaction networks. And we would like to formalize and make sense of the intuitions that the biologists have. This is too big to be done in general, but we try to do this with some families of networks. So in this talk, I will concentrate on biochemical reaction networks under mass action kinetics. I said they give polynomial ordinary differential equa equations. And for me, there will be two sets of parameters, not only the Ks that were um, discussed in the previous lecture, but also the Ts, which are the total amounts, hmm? this right-hand side of these linear conservation relations. And as I said, these reaction rate concepts are in general unknown or difficult to measure. So, in, and in general, in, in people in, a, in a biophysics or biochemistry, they just do exhaustive sampling. And we will try to look at them as special families of polynomials to keep the parameters as much as we can. And we would like to explore this parameter space in order to predict what is happening. But in general, there are too many variables and too many parameters. And this challenges the standard uh, current computational tools. So we need to extend the mathematical result and to understand the structure of the networks to make uh, computations feasible in many cases. <coughs> As I said, even for families with an unbounded number of uh, species or complexes. So you already saw this in um, Hamid lecture. This is the what's called the phosphodesphorylation futile cycle. It's not futile. So here what happens is we have S0 is a substrate and S1 is another form of this substrate. Typically it, uh, it has acquired a phosphate group. The phosphate is not a model here. But when it is when it has this phosphate group, it is activated. Then it goes and participates on a diff and produces maybe another chain of reactions. So uh, what an enzyme is is a molecule that allows a zero to be transformed into S one at a speed that is compatible with life. Okay, it it really accelerates the reaction. The reaction. And so the, the standard modeling, which is the nichelis menten modeling, I will say something about this later, is that E bounds with S0 in this reversible way to produce this ES0 just one molecule, one intermediate molecule or species. It is It has this name because people, it makes you remember that where it comes from. So we understand what's the bio, biochemistry behind and what do you expect from it. And it, it, then it produces S1 and E goes away. So the enzyme comes, catalyzes the reaction and goes away. This is called a kinase. And then there is another F, uh, enzyme called F here, which is a phosphatase that takes the phosphate away in a similar fashion. So this is again an intermediate complex and all these six are positive real numbers. And all this is in general represented like this. So you see this small um, cartoon. But in this small cartoon, there are six species, the two S's, the two enzymes, and the two intermediates, and six nodes, and six reactions, and uh, six um, reaction rate constants. And in fact, we will see that there are even three T, three total amounts. Okay? 
And in fact, the, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine or Medicine 1992 was awarded to Fisher and Krebs because they discovered that this is not futile. This is a good way for the cell to, to transmit the energy. So this is a, a true biological network. The other one is also a true biological network, but this is a very important one. It's called the ERK pathway. And so this is supposed to be the membrane of the cell. So this is the outside. And then there is an, they say there is a signal coming from the outside. And then there are some reactions that produce this molecule, which is RAS. Somehow this RAS will produce this RAF, MEC, ERK. We will see it more mathematically in a, in a second. And this, this go and produces transcript, transcription factor, factors, which eventually take lead the cell to die or to divide or do different really visible uh, things. So mathematically, is we can describe it like this. So remember that each of these are six reactions with all six arrows, six species, whatever. So the means RAS came and acts as an enzyme to take this rough, which is inside the cell, and produce and phosphorylated to produce this other, this would be my S0 and this my S1, but this is, these are the names. And then this, which is the product of the first, the S1, the product in the first uh, layer becomes the enzyme in the second layer. And here, this uh, molecule gets two phosphates, gets two, it's a double phosphorylation. This is a sequential process. And then again, the, the, the substrate here it's the enzyme in the next layer, okay? And it sometimes it's modeled than this, that this could produce a backward reaction here, and sometimes this part is not in, in the model, okay? But as you see, here is maybe a little bit more mathematical. There are uh, 35 uh, variables. Uh, what is, no substrate. This two part plus 73 doesn't make sense. There, there should be a, a typo, he, typo here, but there are eight substrate and maybe it's correct. Maybe it's correct, but anyway, anyhow, the number of variables is 21 or 22. There are 30 reaction rate constants and six or seven total amounts. So in general, we have this number of parameters and these do have more than 20 variables and the order of 36 or 30, 37 parameters, depending on where some, in some modelings, we assume that the enzyme, the phosphate, uh, the phosphate is here is the same as here or not. So the question is, how can we study the associated family of polynomial dynamical systems and say something about it? Because there are too many variables, too many parameters, and we can. How can we do that? Okay, so let me define for you what is a steady state. So a steady state is a constant trajectory. If you are a steady state, you never move. You never reach a steady state unless you are there. It's a constant trajectory. Are the points where all the derivative vanishes, where are the F vanishes? So we have a steady state variety, which is this F is F1 up to Fs if we have S uh, variables. So we have F equal to zero. This is the steady state variety. But we also have these linear spaces, okay? These translates of linear spaces, these affine varieties, which are the, the linear forms. For instance, in my first example, let me go back. This, this linear function equal to T1, this equal to T2. When we put here zero, we get the subspace, which is called the stoichiometric subspace, subspace, and otherwise we have these translates. So we have these equations and these equations, and we're really interested in understanding is the solutions of the whole system. So we have, this is, these are the Fs equal to zero, and these are the linear varieties, uh, L equal to T. And here you see, if we are at this level, there is a single intersection point also here, but here we have three intersection points. 
And here we have two, but one is tangent. It's one with higher multiplicity, right? But what is interesting is, and what you see is that the number of intersection points depends on the total amounts. And here, the, the name for this is that in this case, there is multi-stationarity. What does it mean? It means that, so the systems is, the systems are deterministic. So once we start with an initial condition, the trajectory ma might not converge, but it is deterministic. If it converges, it can only have one possible limit. But depending on where we start here, we can approach maybe different steady states, okay? Depending on whether they are stable or not, which is uh, another question, okay? And as I, I, maybe I said it, but let me say it now, if a trajectory converges, the limit is a steady state. And stable steady state attract nearby trajectories, unstable just produce a repulsion, but then essentially they lead a big part of the dynamics. So to understand what is happening, we try to understand which are the steady state, if they're stable or not. But the first question is, is there one or more than one? Hmm? Or there could be infinitely many, there could be none. Okay, <clears throat> so we say that the chemical reaction network with parameters K has the capacity for multistationarity. If it is possible to find a choice of react reaction rate constant such that for some, same, for <clears throat> some T, like in this system, so for some T, there are there is more than one, uh, there are more than one uh, steady state corresponding to this choice fix of K. So I say it again because my voice is terrible. We say that it has the capacity for multistationarity if there is a choice of reaction rate constants. So this gives one steady state variety, which in general is, is uh, positive dimensional. Whenever we have uh, this linear conservation relations, the steady state variety has positive dimension. So we, and we intersect with these linear subspaces. In general, we expect, by, we expect that there were going to be a finer number of solutions, which in general is the case, not, not obviously not always. And we ask if it is possible for some T to find more than one. If this is the case, then the reaction network has the capacity for multistationality, and this K star is a multistationality parameter. But what we would like to also find is a region of multistationality. This is an open set in parameter space, which for me will also mean maybe K and T, for which for any choice of K star in this open set, or KT in some open set, the system is multistational. As I said, this is a crucial uh, property for chemical reaction network modeling, networks modeling biological processes, because it allows for different responses. Responses of the cell is means depending where you start, you can end, but depending on the initial concentrations, you can end, even if the total amounts are the same, you can end at different steady state, maybe where one the concentration is high, the other is, is low, and it, you can get to different uh, steady state with different uh, medical and biological uh, implications. Mm -hmm. But know that <clears throat> there are many ways of understanding this, but the steady state in general are only given in an implicit way. We cannot compute them. They are, solution of polynomial systems in, in many variables. We, it's a, this is the, the non-algorithmic thing to do. We cannot really get the steady state. We can approximate them. So we, we, they are given implicitly and we have many parameters. So we have to deal with this. So uh, this was also mentioned <clears throat> that with my former students, Mercedes Perimillan, we found that many models which were popular in systems biology, in particular the enzymatic networks as this ERC pathway that I showed to you, have what we called a messy structure. Messy means modification of type enzyme, substrate or swap with intermediates, but of course it refers to Lionel Messi, the Argentinian soccer player. Uh, it was too close not to call it this way. 
so and what we do is we give uh, combinatorial conditions on a mess. So the, the, we are not, I'm not defining what the messy network is, but essentially what we realize is that in general there is a partition in the set of fishes that is for the in this biochemical uh, networks is natural. One are, there are the substrates, the enzymes, the intermediates. It's true that the substrate can be uh, also an enzyme, but somehow it, there is a natural partition of the sets of species which have different behaviors. And in this partition, we only allow certain reactions to occur. It's restrictive, but most studied uh, biological network have this property. And then once we have this partition and this uh, messy, this particular directed graphs, we give combina different combinatorial conditions. I'm not specifying this that allow us to sufficient conditions always that allow us to ensure that there are no boundary steady state. Boundary steady states are steady states that lie in the boundary of the non-negative orthon with some coordinate equal to zero. This is important to see if there is a trajectory, if one of the, something important about this modeling is that of mass action kinetics is the positive orthon and also the non-negative orthon are forward invariant for the dynamics. So if we start at the, pos the, at the positive point, then the whole trajectory will be lying in the positive orthon, but it can approach the boundary or, or it can approach there could be a sequence of points in the trajectory that approach the boundary. So we can ensure that this is not the case. We can also prove that the system is conservative, that the steady, that the, this intersection of these linear varieties with the non-negative orthon is compact. And we give explicit equation for these linear uh, conservation relations. In many cases, we can ensure that the steady state variety is rational so we can parameterize it and go through it. And in also in many cases, which prove we, we can be cut out by very explicit binomials hmm, that we just construct from the combinatorial structure. And of course, in this case, it's also rational and we, we can parameterize it by monomials multiplied by rational functions in the parameters K. And in some cases, this, we prove that the system is linearly binomial. Linearly binomial just means that we can get to a binomial ideal just with operations over R. Huh? We don't need polynomial operations just with standard linear algebra operations, we get binomial. So we get conditions under which this happens. So <clears throat> something that we could also prove is that if we take, for instance, the, so here are a series of pictures that I'm not going to explain, but this is to, to tell you that we, we, we draw very easy um, uh, directed graphs that are derived from the initial directed graph of reactions. And just looking easily at those, we can say if the conditions are satisfied and then assert the, that the uh, conclusions hold true. So this is um, in, a, in a paper with uh, Magali Geroli, which is also a former student of mine, Mercedes, and a colleague from Brazil, Rick Richter. We hope to post this soon. So we also give some combinatorial hypothesis that hold, for instance, in the ERC pathway. Uh, so if, if we take away all the intermediates, so if we, there are some messy structure that if we take away, away all the intermediates, then we can assert that the associated system is monostationary, that multistationarity is not possible. So there is at most one positive solution and we also get conditions for, to assert that there is at least one for any value of K and T. And moreover, uh, let me skip this uh, linearly binomial express, but let me skip this uh, canonical extension for the moment. Something which is interesting to say here is that in this Michelis Menten mechanism, it is for me at least, in this uh, Michelin Mentes mechanism uh, that I showed at the beginning, um, Michelis and Menten did not see the intermediate species. They didn't see it, but they added because otherwise the modeling was not correct. 
So if they were thinking in, in some way mathematically, they added this mathematical object to the modeling, and then it more or less fitted what they were uh, seeing. And what is also interesting is that Michaelis was a very a fantastic biochemist in Germany, and uh, Menten was a female um, young scientist at that time. She was born in Canada in uh, 1878, 76, sorry. And um, she started studying medicine, but at that time, uh, we female could not be researchers in Canada. So she moved to Germany to work with uh, Michaelis. And then she went to the US and she got a PhD in University of Chicago. And she worked for many years in the University of Pittsburgh. She worked on pathology. She produced many, many papers. And uh, she was a, an assistant professor and she was only promoted to um, full professor when she was 69, one year before retirement. Both of them were very, very clever. So I said they were not observing the intermediate species. They produce the idea this from their brains that there could be one because this process is very quick so that the modeling would fit the model. So, and then there is a paper by uh, Amir Hossein, uh, the Gimanesh, I know you pronounce it well, he gave a lecture today with Elisenda Feliu in uh, 2019. They asked where, where, where to add intermediates, in, sorry, where to add intermediates to the modeling to ensure the capacity for multistationarity for what they call complete binomial networks, the ones I am using, like the ERC network, they are and which are the minimal subset of intermediates that we need to add in order to, to get multistationality. So we start with a monostationary network. There is only one point of intersection and we start adding intermediates. How many aware do we need to add intermediates to get multistationality and where the minimal subsets that we need to add? They call these uh, circuits of multistationality. And in this paper that we hope to post soon, we implemented in Maple their criterion, which is based in a, in a previous paper with um, also with Anshu and Carson Conradi, which has the name Toric Steady States. Uh, it has Toric Steady States as a part of the title. And we gave an equivalent formulation with, with a critical function, which is based on Brouwer's degree theory. And this implementation allows us to give full answers in networks like the ERC pathway or theoretica for any number of sequential phosphorylations. As I said, this cannot be done with a general approach using a computer algebra system. Now, we use the particular structure in order to implement this and give the, the answer. And then I would also like to tell you uh, some other uh, thing that I like that we did. So there is a beautiful paper by uh, Frédéric Bian, uh, Paco Santos, and Pierre-Jean Spain-Léauer, published in uh, Sayaga 2018. What they do is they use, so these black points that you see there, here downstairs, are the exponents of the monomials in the, poly in the polynomials we are considering. So we have a, you have a family of polynomials with exponents in these black dots. And then what you can do is you can produce a regular subdivision of the convex hull of these uh, points. So what you do is you pick generic, you pick any lifting, you pick a function h, which is a height function, you, put, you pick liftings of each of the points, and you take the lower hull of this upper configuration and you project. When you do this, if it is sufficiently fine, you're going to get um, triangulation. Otherwise, it's just a subdivision. But it regular means that it comes from this lifting. This have this H, which then you, you produce back. Of course, there are many different H's that produce the same regular subdivision. And some points might not be in the subdivision. For instance, this dot here will not be here because it's the H value is higher. It's not in the lower hole. Okay. 
and they use this to uh, to precisely finding lower bounds for the number of positive solutions of the system. And they do a very uh, beautiful combinatorial study. So this is based on classical result on degeneration and DROS method and tropical methods. And but uh, Schumpf has used this to study real roots, not just positive, but real roots of complete intersections. So let me give you just an example. We skip the general definitions. So this is our support set is 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, what you see here, which are these black dots here. And then we take this matrix C. So with this matrix and these exponents, we cook this a polynomial system. So we get the monomials we draw here, 1, x squared, y, x squared, y, x, y cubed. And the first polynomial has coefficients 1 minus 2, 1, 1 minus 1, 0, and the second polynomial has this. So one fixed the monomial structure, given a polynomial system, is the same information as given this matrix C. And, but then the system can be written as C times this vector of monomials. And you, you see this has uh, degree 2 and degree, uh, sorry, degree 3 and degree 4. So the Bezu bound tell us that there cannot be more than 12 uh, isolated solutions over the complex numbers. And in fact, there is also this uh, BKK bound that tell us that as this is a sparse system, we are not getting all the monomials of degrees three and four. The total number of solutions in the torus with non-zero coordinates is at most the normalized volume of this convex hull, which is in this case just twice the Euclidean volume, which is eight. We cannot have more than eight uh, solutions in the torus. In particular, we cannot have more than eight positive solutions. But what happens is the following. So we have this F1 and F2, and we have this, what you see here is a particular regular triangulation, which have uh, these five synthesis, delta one, delta two, three, four, and five. And then there is a definition that I need to add, is a definition that now we, we are looking for positive solutions. So we need to say, when is it that we get positive solutions? So we look, we fix, for instance, the simplex delta one, which is this one, it, it considers of zero, 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 one, and two, zero. And we just take the part of the matrix, the submatrix of C that correspond to these monomials, which is 1 minus 2 um, minus 2, 1, and 1, 0. And then what we looked, in fact, is at the minus of this matrix. So I take away uh, this first column, I get the maximal minor, which is a minus 1. I take away this column, I take a maximal minor, which is 2. I take away this column and then the minor is equal to minus three. So there is this, the maxima and minors have alternating signs. So then in this case, we see that the simplex is positively decorated by the sub, that this sub matrix of C. C positively decorates the simplex because we have this alternance, which really means that if I consider the linear system um, with this, matrix, we are going to get a positive solution. So in fact, one can check that these four uh, violet simplices are positively decorated, but this cannot. And it, there is a reason for that, because we are asking about signs of minors. And the fact that we are here turning round does not allow to have all the three of them positively decorated by any matrix, not just by this matrix C. This is well studied in the paper by that I mentioned before by uh, Frederic, uh, Paco Santos, and uh, Piazza. So what happens in this case is the following. We ca you can approximate and check that this system has two positive solutions. But the theorem says that if we have this sub regular subdivision, we can scale or degenerate the coefficients to get a system with at least four. We get here four uh, simplices, post decorated simplices. Then we can move the coefficients and get at least four. So the standard way is using one degenerate parameter to de de degenerate. 
So we take any age which induced this subdivision. For any age, there is the theorem says there exists a positive t0 such that for, il, for each t between 0 and t0, the number of non-degenerate solutions of this the form system is at least at least four. There could be more. And what you do is you, you multiply the first um, monomial by t to the h1, the second by t to h2, all the way. Here is five because the, there is a zero, zero times this monomial. A choice of such h is this one. A choice of such, such t is t and is uh, one, one over 12. For this choice of h and this choice of t, you get a system, you get a scaling which produces a system with four positive solutions. And we can check using a symbolic uh, command, for instance, uh, this command in the singular, which is based in this uh, Hermit uh, implementation, Hermit idea uh, also developed by Paul Peder Pedersen, uh, Marie Francois Roy, and Aviva Spirglas to detect uh, the number of uh, solutions with a certain sign using traces in the if the number of complex solutions is finite using Lerner basis. And in any way, you can check that there are four positive solutions, okay? But in general, the number, the number of positively decorated simplices in regular subdivision is smaller. This is just a lower bound. So what did we do? We wanted to have not just one, if you wish, you have like one uh, curve of t's and with this, the parameter is small, you get uh, for solutions, but we got we wanted to have an open set. How do we get an open set? So how do we get an open region of multistationality? We just not want a, a curve of parameters for which there are four solutions. We want an open set of parameters. And so the idea is the following. So we have <clears throat> the exponents that need not only be uh, integers, they could be real because we are looking for positive solutions. It, it's the same, it's the same work. You can assume that they are integers of real and you get exactly the same proofs. So we, we have the exponents fixed. We have the matrix of coefficient. This is, we are given a system of N polynomials in N variables with capital N monomials. So we have, because we have capital N um, exponents. And then we assume that there is a unique regular subdivision of A, and there are P simplices of maximal dimension, which are both all the P of them positively decorated by this, this matrix C. And then instead of looking at just one H that produces this subdivision, we look at the cone of all H's, of all height vectors, H that produce, that have in the regular subdivision that they induce, this subdivision contains these P simplices. And it happens that this is a cone, which is uh, defined by linear inequalities. This is, this is the standard inner product. So these are the linear inequalities that cut out this open cone of all the edges, the H, sorry, height, the height vectors that will give these simplices as part of the associated regular subdivision. And then this is a little bit hard to understand, but essentially is if we pick gammas, just keep this. What, what is important is that here, the, the, the coefficients of the linear form here that define the cone, you need to put them as exponents. So gamma to the MR has to satisfy certain inequalities. It, this is not easy to to parse or just move here. But if we take gammas in this open set, then if you multiply the jth monomial by gamma j, then, and gammas lie in an open space, then all of this system will, be the, which will have at least p positive solutions. This is an article with uh, Magali and uh, Frederic uh, proof, uh, published uh, last year. So which are the difficulties that we need to overcome? So <clears throat> even if the sizing is simplices are part of the same regular subdivision is algorithmic, how do we do this when the dimension or the number of monomials is big or when they are not even upper bounding? How can we 
So in principle, there is an algorithmic answer, but it's too costly. So what we did is the following. It's just a simplification. So if you have two simplices which share a facet, then for sure they are part of some uh, regular subdivision. And then we can easily describe the cone of all sub of all uh, height, height vectors that will have these two simplices in the center of subdivision. So the union of these two simplices will not be convex. But anyhow, if you have just two simplices that share a facet, they are certainly part of the same, in fact, more than one in general, regular subdivision. Then this will allow us to prove that for all the, if we take the cone of H's that will have these two simplices, for then we get an open set of parameters where we have at least two solutions. And in fact, it is easy that in many cases, if you have at least two, you need to have at least three. But we could do this for these uh, systems that um, uh, we were hearing about today, that we even the phosphorylation with n sites with n tending to infinity, we can have open set of multistationality for any n, for any, any not n, two, three, four, for any n, we can define an open set. In fact, it is not completely um, precise because there is there are some there is an epsilon and how small or at t zero how small is the t zero here? Okay, there is there is a warning. So how small is the t zero depends on the implicit function theorem, and so it is not explicit. You don't know how small it is. You need to go sufficiently small, but it's not completely explicit because we need to this also relies on the implicit functions here this t0 is not explicit but it it tells you in which direction direction you need to move in order to find this open set um, and also the problem is that we we use the parametrization the steady states are in this case we, we are, from a rational variety we parameterize these steady states but then when we parameterize, we get as coefficients, non-generic uh, non -generic coefficients, which are not the original uh, rate uh, constant, but are rational functions of the original rate constants. And we need to see that these rational functions, how they are formed, that they are, the denominators do not vanish on the positive orthand. And we need to go back. We need to say, if we scale with this system, with this new rational function for the original constant, how do we scale? the original uh, system, okay? But we heavily use these results about a messy system that I have not uh, described in detail for you. So there are many other current methods to computational uh, tools to deal with these uh, problems. There are methods using degree theory that we also use. This is the main interesting paper. There are many, but uh, this is uh, an a good source is a paper by Carson Conradi, uh, Lisenda Feliu, Maya Mincheva, and Carsten Diouf. There, there is, of course, symbolic software that I don't need to describe to you. And there are general, this is this deal with algebraically closed field. So this one, but you can also work over the reals. There are also uh, tropical tools to separate time scales and use SMT solvers, like in this paper from this year. There are also people using uh, optimis optimization um, tools like what are called SONC. Um, there are also people using numeric and algebraic geometry to understand what um, uh, Amir Hossein was describing today. If, if we are in parameter space, we there is a uh, discriminant is more than a discriminant. We need a discriminant and something more. We need to avoid some boundary solutions, but because we need to avoid that some coordinate equal to zero, but essentially there is a discriminant hypersurface. And each and in each connected component of the complement, the number of positive roots is the same. In, in principle, it's the real roots, but if you further subdivide the number of positive roots is the same on each chamber. And in principle, this can be computed, but it is, again, 
too big in general. So if, if your life is in there, you put all your machinery and try to do it. I tried to compute uh, one of not so big system, but it was a cascade with two layers uh, with an expert in uh, this real software and we couldn't do it. There were too many parameters uh, symbolically. And then there, there are this algebraic approach, but they, you have to focus in one particular system you want to understand and you try to find these open sets where the number of real solutions are the same, positive, and you just pick one on each of them as Amin Hossein was saying. And maybe, I'm not sure, the future computational approach approaches uh, use maybe some machine learning or some, I, I've, I've seen this a paper on mass massive parallel computations in algebraic geometry that was published this year. I don't know if it's, I saw it published or in the archive, I guess this was published, probably in FOCM, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. And then uh, this paper by Mike Steelman and collaborators where they try to use machine learning to improve uh, Grebner basis computation. They, they do uh, symbolic software, but they try to, uh, to use machine learning to improve the, the way it's computed. Also, there is machine learning to approximate the real discriminant to find these chambers. I saw it in this paper. And, you know, there is also this uh, article by uh, Yang Wihe, I don't know how to pronounce it, pronounce it, where he says that he uses machine learning to, uh, to detect mathematical structure, so to detect math here. And so we, we found this messy structure, just looking at it, maybe uh, machine learning can define uh, other math structures that are not visible for, uh, for us. Uh, so as a summary, we can use algebraic geometry to analyze systems uh, biology models. Using this, we can predict some behaviors just from the structure without simulation and with knowing the particular uh, reaction rate constants. And this allows us in many cases to see the woods and not just the trees. Uh, in theory, you have many answers, you have many tools, but in practice, they tend to be too complex or too, to be understood or computers and the answers require, uh, require a combination of tools, not only from computational and real algebraic geometry, but also from dynamical systems, biochemistry, computer science, etc. And thank you very much for your attention. I need to end with two advertisements. One is you have any paper using tools from algebra, geometry, topology uh, related to applications, A fantastic paper, please submit it to this SIAM journal on applied algebra and geometry. And if you have a good paper, I invite you to submit in a Revista de Unión Matemática Argentina. It is a journal of the Argentinian Math Union. It's a diamond open access journal. It's completely free for authors and readers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alicia, for the outstanding talk. Are there any questions, comments, or remarks, please? Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's just uh, about um, uh, chaotic systems. At the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned the Lorentz attractor, and I did not understand what you said. You said that it was. Um, that it, it, it is not of this shape, that the, 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 the standard uh, Lorentz system is not of mass action kinetic shape. It's a polynomial ODE, but in the, for instance, in the, in the derivative. Uh, but it is not of mass action kinetic shape. So well, because I didn't tell you what is the, the harsh and taut um, characterization of which polynomials can show up, which polynomial dynamical, dynamical systems can show up uh, under mass action kinetics. And the answer is easy. So if you have the derivative of xk respect to t equal to fk, in fk, each time you see a monomial with negative coefficient, it has to be divisible by xk. Yes, OK. And the chaotic system does not have this shape. Yes, but uh, I mentioned the dual rail encoding of negative variables. Uh, you know, you can represent a negative value uh, by the difference of concentrations of uh, two positive uh, variables. 
And so you do have an encoding of, um, for instance, Lorentz attractor, uh, where you will see uh, the chaotic behavior. You will observe the Lorentz attractor if you observe the difference of concentrations in the mass action law kinetics theorem. Do you see what I mean? With the dual rail encoding, you introduce uh, one variable for the positive values, one variable for the negative values. You have annihilation. Uh, X plus uh, uh, but, with yeah, X minus I, degrees. But does, does it came from a system coming from mass action kinetics? Yes. Uh -huh. No, there's also, I, I will take a look. I didn't realize there's also. In, in fact, I can show you because uh, anyway, I cannot show you perhaps. Okay, but yeah, I can share my screen. I tried it in Baucam. So. Uh, you you yeah. can share your screen. While you okay. share your screen, I will tell you something. Let me tell you yeah. something else. If you take any whatever system F1, F1, FK, and you multiply all the Fs by the product of the variables, then it becomes mass action kinetics. So this means that if you want, you can have like a Lorentz attractor, but away from the origin. Away from uh -huh. the origin. Okay. I mean, so in any case, this is exactly the rule that is not well formed, indeed, for the reason yes. you say, because uh, Y is degraded. Uh, without uh, varying in the kinetics, uh, yeah. but uh, we, then we could replace it by uh, the, the, the synthesis by catalyst X and Z, uh, the synthesis of the negative value of Y, you see, and uh, in this dual rail encoding, uh, then uh, you would uh, observe uh, that chaotic behavior obtained uh, with the but, different... But then you mean that you're not, sorry, you're not assuming then that, that the variables are going to be positive? Uh, here, it's not the case, but uh, with the dual rail encoding, they will be, they will be. Uh, then perhaps there is a problem, perhaps, um, because you need to have a, an annihilation relation uh, reaction between the positive and negative values uh, or variables associated or variables. To, uh, to another real variable. And so perhaps there is a problem of kinetics there. Yes, indeed. Yeah, perhaps. But uh, okay, I wanted to ask the question because. Uh, Thank you. I, I will write to you to, to have this. Uh, yeah. I yeah. will check it. Thank you. Okay. I, I will try also. Yeah. Uh, I have the following simple question. Uh, in the very beginning of your lecture, you have introduced the concentrations of components. Uh, according to the chemical or physical meaning, each concentration must remain always non-negative. How do you ensure the satisfaction of all these properties within your methodology? Thank you. So this is, sorry, thank you for the question. This is a consequence of a the fact of, of the theorem that I told you. So the fact that in the FK, if there is a negative monomial, it has to be divided by xk. It can be proved in a more or less easy way that the positive orthand is forward invariant. It's a consequence of the form of the polynom of the equations that come out from this mass action kinetics. So that model. this property is always satisfied by your problem. always, uh, always. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me tell you something else, what is for me very interesting. This mass action kinetics was proposed by two Norwegians, uh, Gulberg and Vage, in the 19th century. And one was a biochemist, but the other one was a mathematician. And it's a very mathematical theory. And so it's interesting that one of the founders was a mathematician. Oh, nice. How beautiful. Uh, any further questions or remarks, please? Uh, actually, I do have a couple of questions, Alicia. And uh, the first one is this. Uh, so your model that you're using is fully deterministic, right? Yes. It's not randomized at all. So is there any hope to include any kind of randomization into this model? Because it may sometimes occur in biology and in real systems. Yeah, yeah. In, in general, what people do, so there are also the stochastics model, use Markov chains. And in general, what hap I think that the true model is when you approach the boundary. So if, as I said, if there are enough molecules and one mix, I think this is a good model. This, I cannot really talk about this, it's not my specialty. But I think that when the, there's 
the concentrations become to be too small, even if they are not zero, you, you would need to pass to a, to a um, random uh, modeling. Okay. Okay, I, okay. I think probably more realistic would be to, to, to use a random modeling when some of the variables are small and then to assume it continues otherwise. Okay. So there are many models. People study um, uh, also random models. And people also try to get the models just from the data. So, but my point of view, OK, there are many, many articles produced by biochemists and biologists. They use this. And I was trying to see what can as we as mathematicians do to to help or to, to add to what they are doing. Really? So it's it's this was my question. OK, I see. Uh, and also another a more technical uh, question that I have is about uh, the exact condition. So maybe you could comment a bit more on the condition which ensures that the steady state variety is actually rational. You mentioned that uh, it is sometimes rational and there are some conditions. So what are those? Yeah, but these are always sufficient conditions. They are never necessary. So they, they are in this paper on messy systems that we, in fact, we built on previous paper. There was a previous paper by Jeremy Guanaguardina and Thompson, and there were there was a previous, I mean, it was not the first time we just somehow systematized things that had been there around. I can point this, it's a particular theorem in, in, in my paper. I cannot summarize it now. I but see. it's also, it's just, you can somehow read it combinatorially. I see. In some way. Well, and just a final remark. It was really encouraging to hear that this kind of approach can potentially be used in standard epidemiological models. So can you comment on this? Is there any yeah, hope that the pandemics will eventually end and we can meet again as before? Yeah. Just one warning. So epidemiological yes. models have this shape, but they are different because in general, in epidemiological models, you have this oscillation and you have they have a different behavior many times they are not steady state so it, it they, they land into this world of chemical reaction networks but in a far distant continent so our approach is not about any type of crns it's just this type that mostly used in in biochemistry but i hope that we can help epidemiologists to get away of this pandemic <laughs> yes yes let's hope for the best okay if there are no further questions there online or in auditorium yes Evgeny Vasilyevich. i have one more question uh, it was mentioned that uh, uh, in some cases uh, th uh, there can be several stationary states uh, uh, can it happen that uh, uh, the system under study can uh, jump from one steady state to another bifurcation uh, what uh, uh, can you predict such situations mathematically? Before Sorry, what do you mean by what do you mean by jump? Of uh, suddenly pass from one stationary state to another, which may be close to one another. So the, uh, the the system bifurcation. Well. I think that any any dynamic <laughs> behavior can happen, but I, I never studied this. So if you are too close to a steady state, and if it is, so if both are attractors, if you are too close to both of them, then you will just stand there. But maybe if you are not so close, you can just move to the other one. And uh, I mean, there could be um, trajectories could do many things that are described by dynamics. I don't know. I, I never studied this, so I can I cannot tell you. The only thing that I can we do is to say, wh when is it? So there also there was a question: when it is stable, it's uh, exponentially stable, because what what people study is that the, the if the linearization has all eigenvalues with negative real part. In fact, not eigenvalues because of the of these um, linear conditions. There are some eigenvalues that are always zero, but the rest have negative uh, real part. But again. Uh, they will exponentially attract trajectories once they have sufficiently small. And how small depends on, again, implicit function theorem. I and mean, you'd never know. So I don't know. 
<laughs> probably this would happen. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, comments, or remarks, then we thank Alicia again so much for the outstanding talk. Thank you so much. Yes, and this concludes our afternoon session. So if there is nothing else anybody wants to say, then we close for now. And tomorrow morning we start at 9.30, according to the schedule. Thank you so much again, Alicia. We appreciate you. your participation very much. Thank you.